Testing, testing. All right, I think Mary decided to abandon us. Uh, no, she's. I'm sure she'll be back. I think Don's going to be leading us off anyway. So should we get started? And uh oh, Patrick's got jokes. Hold on. Comes to recruitment of staff and positions. Dana actually let me know that the city of New York City is looking to hire a rat czar to um, win the war on rats. New York Mayor Eric Adams is looking for a leader in the city's war on rats, according to the job posting. Of the rodents and can expect a salary of around $170,000 a year. So if you hate rats as much as they do, there may be an opportunity waiting for you in New York City. I'm going to let you start. I'm going <laughs> to let you take that over. Did we did we ever get a cat czar? That was our. Oh, no, just kidding. <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm not. I, bad jokes, bad jokes. I'm sorry. You could you could call him bad or dead. All right. Well, without further ado, well, thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak. So we're gonna we're gonna be covering a little bit of an update. Um, and and Mary and Don and I were we're recognizing that um, we've got obviously our new council member Alex here and you didn't have the opportunity to hear this presentation a year ago. And so Don's gonna kick things off with a nice kind of a recap and a historical perspective of um, what you could refer to as the great resignation, right? That was that was taking place across the country, probably across the world um, over the past year, year and a half and um, where Gilbert was and then uh, and then we'll lead into where we are and where we're going. So Don, I'll turn it over to you. Slides for you. If we could, that would be great. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna have Nathan progress the slides. I have some notes here just to make sure I don't forget anything. Some things are really important to mention. Um, so we're gonna start with um, attention, the world of work saw a lot of things. Some of the things that um, as COVID was going up and down, things were closing and opening. There was a lot of um, things that created a perfect storm. And we started really looking, watching, and listening um, to what was happening in recruitment because we were experiencing some things as well. Some of the things that the world of work was experiencing is the great resignation, um, which a lot of people throughout COVID started to rethink their lives and started to think, you know, what should I be doing? What I'm doing is not what I want to be doing and just really started resigning in record numbers. I think November of 21, there was a record number of uh, resignations as reported by Forbes. I think 11 point something million people resigned from their position. So significant res resignations. The other thing we saw is um, the great retirement. So a lot of people started saying, hey, I don't want to work anymore. And so I'm just going to retire. So we saw huge numbers of retirements, you know, in, in the workforce in general. Um, also at that time, what started to happen was a record inflation. You started to see inflation going up, lots of pressure in the marketplace. Um, and so that was really a struggle for employees. And so we started seeing that. The other thing is um, be, with a lot of people leaving, organizations, what that did was it opened up a lot of opportunity for, for employees to go from position to position. And we saw a lot of movement within the marketplace as well. So as we were looking at this, go ahead and click Nathan. Um, we started to see, you know, again, a concerning trend of turnover. Um, and we saw that in, in the country, but we also saw that in the Valley as well and, and saw that in some of the things we were looking at. Um, so what happened is we started to uh, have conversations with the council on what we were seeing and some of the things we were looking to undertake and review and study and research to try and understand. Um, as I mentioned, we were also seeing our own struggles within the town. Um, and um, so we wanted to do something about that. Next slide. So what we did is in the winter of 2022, um, we put together a working group um, to really look at recruitment and retention within the town. 
Um, and that was a cross departmental group of staff to uh, kind of explore that. And, you know, each department within the town and, and I think, you know, just looking across workforce in general has different needs. They have different priorities. They have different things that are going to attract folks to, to those career fields or um, retain them as well. So we wanted that cross section of folks to look and to listen, to hear, um, and to tell us what, uh, what would be valuable for their groups. Um, we also, uh, during that time, saw um, just an urgent need to impact um, the, the things we were seeing. So we started to look at you know things that we could do some of the challenges we were seeing specifically is we had some really high vacancy rates in some of our departments upwards of 40 percent in some areas which was significant and some areas um, that were a struggle for us to even get great candidates um, and so you know it was just a really long and hard time of working through that um, so with that uh, we one of the initiatives that we came up with, with the inflation um, and with kind of looking at what other cities and other organizations were doing, and then also looking internally and having our conversations with our groups, was to come to the council to with um, some initiatives to kind of try to uh, combat the inflation that we were seeing um, and to have some retention and recruitment strategies that we thought would be helpful. So. Uh, Council was gracious, and, um, and we thank you for that, um, and approved a 5% um, inflationary adjustment for employees at that time, and then also um, uh, a health care pay down, which was an amount of money that was put into the trust to help decrease uh, the amount that employees were paying for premiums, so that decreased um, the cost for employees as well. And then also throughout the pandemic, Gilbert is very lean and we saw a lot of instances where employees were unable to take vacation. Um, and so vacation carryover was an, an additional thing that uh, council approved at that point in time. Um, in conjunction with that, the working group did continue and came up with a list of initiatives that uh, really we were gonna look at what could we do now what could we do in the near term? And then what could we do long term? Because this is something that we saw that was ongoing. So we know that we need to look at this and we need to continue looking at it. So we wanted to have initiatives that we could do throughout that, uh, throughout the whole time as, we, as we're having these struggles. So um, the team divided into small groups and really has begun to dig into these initiatives. And um, I'll go over kind of how, um, how we're doing that in a second. It's on the next slide, but really phase one is really looking at research, looking at the initiatives and saying, you know, what, what would that look like? What would that take? What would it cost? Like all of those things that, that we need to be able to understand what those initiatives would take and then what impact they would have on our employees and our, work, our workforce. Next slide. So I wanted to highlight this because I want you to see kind of what we used as our, our prioritization for how we prioritize, the, prioritize those initiatives. We had a, a super uh, awesome team of, uh, of subgroup of our, our um, larger team, and that included Kelly Faust and um, Alina and Nina DeCastro from People Team, who kind of came up with this strategy of how do we look at these initiatives and how do we determine which ones are gonna be the most effective and impactful. And they came up with these different areas of weight that we use to filter through and determine where our priorities are gonna be. And that is, we would focus on uh, whether or not the, uh, the initiative was going to impact recruitment and retention or one or the other. Um, and whether or not um, what the cost would be to launch and manage that initiative. And then also um, an another large um, factor that we took for initiatives, we looked at in, in ranking the initiatives was how many people, how many employees within the town would be impacted. So just as an example, if we had an initiative that as we ranked through that that initiative was going to impact recruitment and retention, 
that initiative was going to have a low cost to launch and that initiative was going to impact the most employees, that initiative would be one that would be ranked closer to the top for us to really look at and dig into to see if, if there's um, things that we could do in that area. So I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Mary right now so that Mary can talk to us about the initiatives or talk to you about the initiatives that we already have underway. Thank you, good morning, Mayor and Council Mary Goodman. I'm an assistant town manager. Um, so as Don mentioned, we've got the group already moving on some of these items um, and we wanted to just share with you some of the work that's been going on since the spring. Um, number one, we looked at some low cost uh, referral incentives that could be offered to employees that successfully recruit a candidate to the town. And Nathan's team put in a budget package for this next year, which Nathan, I think the incentive goes up to about $200. $250 per employee that successfully recruits um, a candidate to the town, which again is a low cost, potentially high um, incentive for, for employees. We've also uh, started backup leadership forums. So we recently had one, Nikki, on October 27th, I believe, or in and around that time. Um, but well attended over at the university building. It's an opportunity for the leaders in the organization to connect and offer continued training. Um, but really we're seeing uh, out of the pandemic, the desire for the teams to connect in person across the departments. And so that's a great opportunity to get those back up and running. Um, we're also looking at conducting stay interviews. So oftentimes you do an interview with employees as they're putting in notice to ask why, what caused you to leave. And what the group is trying to do proactively is for our employees that are, you know, no matter where you're at in the organization, what's causing you to stay? What do you love about Gilbert? And what could cause you to leave? Because those are um, early uh, preventative measures we can take to try to stem any sort of recruitment or retention issues later on. Um, we are also kicking back off soon town halls. Um, our town manager doesn't love getting in front of that camera for those, but employees love them. Um, I don't know why. No, no, he does a great job. Uh, it's a great forum for employees to be able to connect with our town manager, ask questions, um, and hear what's going on in the organization. We've hosted a variety of different topics. Those started during the pandemic as a way to connect with employees. And we've heard the teams uh, request more of those. We're exploring those. Also looking at a wider use of predictive index, which is a great way to help um, look at the strengths that exist within your team and different areas that you, you may have gaps in that you wanna um, highlight and recruit for specifically as you're looking at uh, recruitment. And then um, looking at different career opportunities within the organization cross departmentally. So no matter where you're at, uh, looking at creating that pipeline of talent and opportunities for people to move um, up the ladder, either in their team or across the organization. Next slide. So phase one. We have been, uh, one of the things that we heard loud and clear in our recruitment and retention team was uh, the town has what's called a pay for performance approach. So oftentimes in cities and towns, you will see a step program. So every year, as long as a person meets their performance, um, they move a predetermined step. Gilbert does it differently. We have a program that specifically incentivizes performance. So employees go through an annual evaluation process and there is a matrix that's determined uh, every year based on a variety of factors, including um, CPI and other items. And employees go through their evaluation and then based on their performance, that um, is what indicates what sort of uh, adjustment they may receive that year. But one of the things that comes with that, because the percentages can change from year to year, is we get questions from employees wanting to know what to expect, how does the system work? And so we realized that we um, would like to do some additional education of the workforce so that employees know what to expect and um, help managers be able to talk to their employees about any questions they may have. Uh, we're also working to figure out ways, this is one of the most challenging ones, of trying to reduce burnout with employees early intervention, making sure people are taking time to themselves, you know, if it's nights and weekends, making sure you're encouraging your team members to log off and that email can wait until Monday morning unless it's urgent. Um, 
but figuring out different ways that we can address uh, burnout and be cognizant of how many things we're asking our team members to do. Looking at educating the workforce on also benchmarking process, that's another thing that Gilbert does very proactively is we go through the entire organization and I believe Nathan, it's every two years. Every two years, each team is benchmark, benchmarked within the market to see if their pay is competitive. And that's something that um, is pretty unique to Gilbert. Oftentimes you'll take an entire organization through, but it will only be every five years, every 10 years, a, a more prolonged period of time. And so we do very proactive benchmarking to stay competitive with the market. Um, but again, educating employees on what that looks like, how it translates to them, how and if they move in their range as a result. Um, Looking at creating a mentorship program within the organization, that's something we also heard loud and clear is people want opportunities, not even just within their teams, but in other teams to have opportunities to learn about different um, processes, different uh, projects. And I think that's something that Gilbert does exceptionally well is build cross departmental teams and provide opportunities for employees across the organization to participate in something that may or may not be in their line of service. So we're looking to establish that more formally. Um, and again, that leads into building uh, cross departmental teams. We've launched a number of them in the last couple of years. This actually being one of them recruitment and retention. We had a phased rollout team with the pandemic. We've had um, a cross departmental team that helps us with retreats that's sitting in the audience with us today. There's a number of these that we launch across the organization to help offer um, continued exposure of employees and learning opportunities. And then lastly, looking at tuition reimbursement um, for and potential program expansion, expansion for employee and leader development. So traditionally tuition reimbursement has been for college related courses, but what we're hearing a lot of demand for, especially in our um, front lines, is potential to look at reimbursement for certifications. And even more specifically, um, right now, the person has to go through the program and then is reimbursed. We're looking at whether or not we can do some proactive um, cost covering for certification so that an employee may or may not have the, the ability to pay for a certification up front. And so we're looking at ways we can hopefully offset some of those, those issues, um, especially in our, in our front lines. Next slide. All right, next phases. So continued items that we are looking at is every single time we go out uh, to post a new job in the market, we ask teams to look at the description. Does it meet the need? Are there any areas that we want to refresh or change? And um, is it uh, commensurate with what we're seeing in the market? Is it providing opportunities that for people to progress and grow? Is it something that's going to be attractive to incoming employees? So looking at those continually. Um, looking at revamping some of our employee recognition programs, we hear, you know, consistently that, of course, anybody wants an opportunity to, if you work really hard, you want to know that your supervisor, your team is noticing, and um, we're looking at ways to uh, revamp that program. More leadership training, uh, both through the people team and, and additional channels, all employee events. Uh, we're getting ready to host an employee event as we open our town hall. Looking at hiring efficiencies, uh, what we can do to shorten the length of time from when we post or somebody applies to when we can actually bring somebody on board and then uh, shortening that onboarding process whenever possible. Career road mapping, um, that's something again, going back to those leadership opportunities and creating those channels for growth within the organization. More town supported certification, as I mentioned. And then this one is really important, um, employee wellness time. Nathan, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it might be helpful for you uh, to talk some about the article that you've seen and was shared at a recent SHRM conference with respect to mental health and benefits and the importance that they're playing in the marketplace today. Um, but I'll hang on that till we, all right, next slide. Okay, so at that, I'm gonna go ahead and actually transition over and then you can. All right, <clears throat> yeah, before I actually I go back, just. So you're not distracted <clears throat> and I'm Nathan Williams. I'm the chief people officer for, for those. I haven't had a chance to, to meet yet, but, um, so what Mary's referring to, there was a really great uh, research study that was conducted by um, the Society for Human Resource Management recently, and it was across companies and industries um, across the country. I believe there were, there were international um, global organizations that were involved. And what they found, one of the most um, kind of eye-opening components was that a third of employees that were surveyed um, would actually elect for more or additional mental health benefits over additional pay. 
So we, we tend to assume, right, that like the, the carrot is always raises in pay, right? It's, it's annual increases, it's inflationary adjustments, it's cost of living adjustments. Um, but, but that was really telling that the need, the demand, um, and the desire to have more access to, to health care, to wellness, to mental health um, within, you know, as from their employer is, is more important to um, as much as a third of the organization or, or organizations as a whole. So that's pretty telling. Um, and that's something that we're really trying to pay close attention to is, you know, as, as Mary mentioned, you know, we're, we're talking about things like burnout. Um, we recognize that, you know, the, the, the impacts of trauma and stress, um, anxiety on our first responders um, is substantial. And, and beyond that, um, the impacts of, you know, when you're dealing with things like turnover and vacancy, everyone bears a burden as a result of that, right? When you don't have all of your staff, well then the staff that are here are putting in extra hours, they're picking up extra shifts, they're taking on extra assignments. <clears throat> and a lot of that sometimes unfortunately ends up being having to be mandated so that we can ensure that there's no interruption to our services um, that we offer to this community. So it's, there's a lot of things that, that come into um, that, that arena of mental health, um, avoidance or, or, or reduction of burnout, um, and, and just making sure that, that, our, that our employees are the best that they can possibly be. Um, there's a few things that are going on um, that are happening around us, and you've probably heard some of these already, but we are taking a good look because we just want to make sure um, that we remain an employer of choice, um, not only for our existing staff, but as we make an effort to recruit. Um, and, and we have to be mindful of um, the, the moves and the, and the decisions that are being made um, in some of our neighboring communities. So. <clears throat> First and foremost, um, I'm sure you've seen, it was all over the news, and um, I got about 26 emails from staff across the organization, in case I hadn't seen it, um, that, that Mesa has announced that they're gonna be relaunching their post-retirement um, health benefit. Um, and this is a pretty substantial um, undertaking on Mesa's part. I think I saw that they plan to put aside $25 million a year for the next 10 years to prepare for it. I think they're missing the mark. I think that it's going to be much more costly than they're, they're even budgeting for today. But either way, um, you know, we, we're working with our actuary um, through our um, health care broker to um, identify what, what would be the cost implications if we did some version of this. So we're looking at a series of, of options and, and, and opportunities. Um, that would be something that we would obviously um, bring to council for further discussion if, if we identified a path forward. But we do recognize um, that there is probably no low cost path forward in that space. Deferred compensation contribution. So this is something that um, some of our, it's about 50-50 it's about um, other cities in the, in the valley, what we call our benchmark cities, um, they do this now. So beyond your um, Arizona State Retirement or your Public Service Retirement Program, a lot of agencies um, recognize that um, to be a little more competitive with the private sector, there needs to be some additional um, deferred compensation that gets added into retirement programs. So um, we're, we're looking into this as, as well, at, you know, if, if there's a possibility of some sort of employer contribution component. Uh, paid family leave, so I'm sure some of you know, maybe the others don't, we offer um, paid parental leave um, in Gilbert, and this is a really amazing program that I, I, I like to say. I, I don't have ex sure data to say it, but I'm pretty confident that we were the first city in the valley to roll it out. Um, that we, we offer four, up to four weeks of paid leave for new parents, and that could be adoption, foster, birth. Um, that could be mother or father. Um, and, and, and this is a really exciting program that a lot of our employees have been able to take advantage of. Um, we, we know that there are cities that are already expanding this program now and going beyond that to paid family leave because I'm sure many of you in the room maybe are not having kids anymore right? You've, you've moved on past that phase of life. And we recognize that the, the need for um, access to time away from work changes very significantly as we go through different points in our lives, right? It may be elder care for, for aging parents. It may be an adult child who has now been diagnosed with something and you need to bring them back in your home and take care of them. It may be a spouse. Um, and so we're trying to look at the possibility of an expansion of our paid leave program to cover more um, qualifying events than just, than just parental leave. 
And then lastly, longevity pay opportunities for our public safety um, personnel. Um, typically what happens, and we do, as Mary said, we do pay for performance, except our sworn personnel are still on step. And the reason for that is um, it, it's to be competitive, right? We wanna make sure that our pay model is competitive and in line and matches that of the other cities around us. The challenge with a step program is you top out. So usually five to seven years within a position you top out. So, well, what can you do then? You can keep making the same pay you make, right, for, for the foreseeable future, or you can promote, but there's not always an opportunity for every qualified uh, person to promote into another role. And so um, there are cities around us that are offering what's called longevity pay, and these are incentives when somebody has topped out to continue to um, kind of reward them for great performance. So again, these are just things that we're looking into. We're doing some analysis and, and, and trying to gather as much information as we can to assess what, what would be the cost of some of these ideas. <clears throat> um, I wanted to run you through really quick turnover and vacancy data, and I will try to go back a little bit. Don did a great job of, of kind of um, recapping some of the what got us here. I'm going to try to touch on a little of that, maybe more than what's on the slides, if I've got time. How are we doing? Okay, cool. Um, I saw you. I'm like, Mary's the timekeeper. Oh, I got it. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, I, I want to I turn your attention to the line graph. And I want to make something kind of clear. So this is a rolling 12-month trend. And what that means is you're not going to see a significant impact month to month to the line, right? Because what it's doing is every point on there is going back 12 months in time. So when you see the line growing, what you know is your trend over a 12-month cycle is increasing. When the line flattens after it's been growing, that actually means more recent months are declining, but the data doesn't look quite that way. So I'm gonna show you a better way to kind of articulate the data a little more granularly in a second. But what I wanna show you is um, in the midst of like what Don mentioned, what, you know, what everybody was calling the great resignation, we started to see that climb, right? We were seeing more both retirement and non-retirement turnover um, in the town from about, um, it really started in about December of 2020, um, but then that line started to grow um, until right up until about the end of this past calendar year. Um, the good news is we have started to flatten that. So council's um, approval of the um, inflationary adjustment and the impact to premium cost increases was, I think, a huge win for the organization because you can see that right about April when that was approved um, is when our line started to flatten. So thank you. I can't thank you enough because the burden that was being placed on my team to manage But, you know, speaking from the heart, it means a great deal that the council um, was was open to that opportunity and supportive of it. And then down here at the bottom is just all the data. If you're a if you're a data nerd and you like to read all the percentages, you can see um, those trend changes. But I'll get into the what I think is a little bit more. Oh, this is what I just talked about. So so you see the growth there and then you see the flattening here. Um, and then you can see at the bottom here kind of the same perspective that you can see that the percentages start to sort of level off. So we were still, you know, we were still seeing rolling numbers looking pretty consistent, but they weren't growing um, over the past four or five months, which is great to see. And so here you can see that the trends are declining. So this, even though it's very cyclical, right, when you have turnover and, and you know, people are retiring at certain times of the year based on certain reasons or incentives um, or, or personal things. Um, people are resigning at certain times of the year based on the job market factors and all of that. What you can see is the trend line, and I think that's what's important to call out here. So both um, retirement uh, or kind of all turnover data and the non-retirement data is on the decline, which is exciting to see. Um, what's really great, and I'll call your attention to, is the the total hires and separations, and this is just to give a quick high five. We got Kristen on my team here um, observing today, but just to give a quick high five to the people team, but it's hiring managers, it's the, it's the organization as a whole. Um, in, in FY22, which as a reminder, that's July 1 of 21 up to June 30th of 22, um, we had 138 hires, but we had 110 people leave the organization. What's amazing is we had, we've had 74 people leave this current fiscal year, but we've hired 162. So we have, re, we have filled a lot of those vacant positions that stood vacant um, for quite some time as a result of some of this substantial turnover that occurred the year prior. So that's right, and we've got more to go, right? We're, we're only in 
What month is it? December? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's December. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it doesn't count really, right? Um, that, that's absolutely true, though. We've got half the year left, um, so we've got more work to do, and, and we'll continue to make sure that we've got um, great people in all these positions to, to make sure we continue to deliver uh, the great services and, um, and opportunities to our community. And then um, I want to talk a little bit about where we've kind of, again, just with the numbers, where we've gone. And I'll back up beyond um, the the first point here, but um, as Don mentioned, um, the, the the level and the volume of, of resignations that were occurring um, in fall and winter of 2021, um, and that it continued to occur nationally um, into the spring of this year, was record breaking. Um, you know, the we had we had never seen anything like it, and I'm sure now if you're a, if you're a LinkedIn user, um, especially well, maybe it's just me because I. Everybody out on LinkedIn that I'm connected to is in HR, but but layoffs right now are huge, right? Now layoffs are happening mostly in the tech sector, um, and they're happening a lot of times in the sales and the HR sector because they hired on all these recruiters last year to refill all these positions, and now they're starting to lay those recruiters off. The same thing with sales; they're seeing sales wane and decline, and so they're starting to lay off a lot of those 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 sales folks that have been brought on, and so. We are, we are assuming, right, that we're going to see a significant dip, even though I think I saw this morning that jobs numbers for last month were pretty, were pretty solid. So it's hard to say, right? This is a really weird economy, a really weird market. Um, but we do know that nationally um, resignations were out of hand um, a year ago. And we weren't suffering the same way that the kind of trends were showing. We were suffering more than we were used to. Um, but I do think that our culture, I do think that the great um, – you know, the benefits of working for Gilbert, the, the team, the leadership, the community, people are really loyal um, to, to Gilbert, which is great to see. But, you know, while, go ahead. Just one asterisk to what you just said would be that organizationally, we weren't experiencing to the same degree. Um, we, we're seeing higher turnover numbers than we were comfortable with and that we had experienced before. But the biggest challenge we had is that we were acutely experiencing significant turnover in um, public safety and dispatch with environmental services, with our drivers. So in IT, there were a number of teams that were pulling up the entire organization numbers because we were seeing huge vacancies in those teams. Um, Jessica, I don't recall what the figure was offhand, but environmental services, we had it at one point. Yeah, so a huge number in PD dispatch, I think at one point we were at 40% vacancy. So um, we experienced very significant pockets of uh, challenges that were that seemed at the time almost insurmountable. So I give a huge amount of credit to um, not the people team, but not just the people team, the teams across the organization who thought very creatively quickly to figure out how we could bring those teams on. And those 162 recruits that you saw successfully hired on the last screen, that is a collective effort across the entire organization to get more people through the first six months than we had in the entirety of all of last year. So I just wanted to pause to, to give kudos to the team on that. Yeah, thank you. And, and, I, and I will say too, along the same lines of that, we're not a butts and seats organization. We do not just hire to get people in the door and get people in seats. We are very selective in, in every area. Um, we are, there is, there is a thorough process to our recruitment effort, to our interviewing process, um, because we want to make sure that we, re, we continue to deliver at the, the, the high service levels that we always have here in this community um, and in this organization. So, you know, we, we probably could have gotten real aggressive and just started hiring and getting people in the door and, and, and loosening up our, our expectations. And, and we did not do that and we will not do that. So um, that's a great point, Mary. Go ahead, Don. Sorry, I just want to add to that, that the other thing is we are still seeing challenges in the market in terms of what employees and what employees are looking for. They are still looking for an extreme amount of flexibility, working remotely, other things which make it a challenge to hire you know, folks into some positions. Um, we, we have been grateful here. We have our 410 work schedule. We have our remote work that we're able to do, which has been extremely helpful in that, but there's still a lot of challenges out there with hiring um, in a lot of areas. So 
the people team, the teams around around the town have done an awesome job, even in the face of some of those other things we're seeing as well. Absolutely. And man, that beautiful new building is gonna is gonna help too. Muni One's gonna be a, a great attractor for for our people. Um, so just to give a quick update, this is again, this is a kind of the data we covered last year when we did this um, review with council. We were sitting at about nine and a half percent vacancy in January of 2022. So almost 10% of our positions were vacant. Um, this is really tough, like Mary touched on. When you're talking about environmental services, or you're talking about dispatch, you're talking about our police and fire departments, we don't have a whole bunch of extra people. We run really, really lean. So, you know, when when another city might talk about their vacancy rates, um, they've got a buffer factor built in that, that Gilbert does not really l utilize. So, you know, we we don't have extra environmental services people on call and ready. If if there is if there is someone to not take a route in environmental services, um, the existing team finishes their route and then they go pick up that extra route. Um, you know, I live in Phoenix and and. I, my, bulk, my bulk trash service was delayed by five weeks over the past month. We actually ended up sending our bulk trash drivers to Phoenix to pick up shifts to help out to get them caught up. I'm not even sure it got picked up this week, and I think this was my week. Um, so so the, the fact that we have had um, continuity of services and they've been uninterrupted um, throughout this process is, is amazing as well to our public works team, to our police and fire departments, to our parks and rec teams, everybody um, it, with the, that Herculean effort. Um, and then you can see what, this was what was really troubling was we, we continued to see this rise as we went into this calendar year. We were at 11% vacancy in February. But what's amazing is um, the most recent data we have, which I believe was closing out October or November, excuse me, uh, we're at six and a half percent. So a huge um, uh, downtrend to our overall vacancy data. Um, and this is, it, you know, it kind of natural or, or, or normal to sit maybe at a five or six percent vacancy, depending on natural, you know, people retiring, turnover that's occurring. You're always going to have some positions that are vacant, um, but we've really been able to work hard to manage. Now, there's a couple call outs and then I want to give kind of a future perspectives here. Um, so in our sworn um, within police, uh, we only have three vacancies currently out of 263 um, positions. That's 1.1%. That is phenomenal. And that is a, a testament to our police department. And I'll tell you, we're not offering incentives to hire. Some of our neighbors are offering $5,000, $10,000. I think I just heard a a $25,000 incentive that's being offered somewhere? What's that? Yeah, um, we, we, we have not done that. And guess what? We've actually had a lot of rat, a lateral recruitments, meaning people leaving these other cities to come to Gilbert. So that is, a, that is a huge testament to Gilbert. Now, it's important to point out we're not done. The, we are also going to see over the next three to five years a record number of retirements in both our police department and our fire department. So the work's not done. The work won't stop. We don't get to kick our feet up. The people team doesn't get to take a break, nor does the organization. We, we have to recognize um, that the consistent need to continue to recruit great talent, continue to build our bench, continue to plan for the future um, is critical. The other really great um, piece of data here is within our sworn firefighters, engineers, and captains. We've got five vacancies currently out of 206 percent or 206 positions. So that's uh, two and a half percent vacancy within our sworn fire, which is amazing as well. So the, these are some really exciting things that I wanted to make sure we called your attention to. But as I said, um, the work's not done and, and the work will continue. Questions? Yeah. Team Kyle, you have two planners vacant right now. At one point, we had four, um, and they were carrying up to 30, 25, 30 cases a piece, which the normal case load is about 13. And I know this group in particular understands what cases have been like lately in terms of the amount of extraordinary effort and time and um, everything that was into those. So again, across the organization, Dana's team, Dan's team, I mean, you look around the room, every single team has experienced those challenges. So, um, but we very much appreciate this council, uh, your support and leadership through this process um, and continued commitment to help make sure that we retain the best and the brightest. 
um, as we've heard recently at you know, the chamber roundtable, th these challenges are not over. And as Nathan mentioned, we have to stay ahead of that curve. We don't want to lose momentum for the great work that's been done in the last six months. Um, we want to we want to try to stay ahead of that. Oh, it's going to be exciting, and I promise my slides are not as pretty as everyone else. Mine's just text because I'm not good at good at doing the other stuff. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about today are ordinances, and we're not talking about zoning ordinances. Those are a different creature. Those are brought when there's rezoning applications and they come through the Planning Commission and ultimately to the Council. So we're going to talk the ordinances that are tied to our town code. So as you all know, Gilbert has a town code. Um, we are a general law town, which means we're subject to Title IX and the authority that the Council has to enact laws or ordinances there are version of laws or ordinances or our code provisions comes from the state legislature. Um, the council does not have authority to be, act beyond what's been authorized by state law. Um, a lot of cities, because we are a town, we're subject to Title IX, a lot of cities are called charter cities and they have a charter, which is different from us, which is their own set of laws that, are, that it gets approved by the citizens in that city. So if you hear about the term charter cities, that's what that is. We're not that. We're a general law city subject to Title IX. So we have, a, we have a town code. That's the town's laws, the town's ordinances. There are uh, 21 chapters in the town code that cover a whole bunch of different topics. You know, traffic, animals, telecom, buildings, elections, all that kind of stuff. It's interesting because our town code is based on the original 1984 code that was in place and then has been modified hundreds and hundreds of times since. So if you look at our town code, there's 21 chapters, but they're not numbered consecutively. We go from chapter one and the final chapter is chapter 66. And there's a whole bunch of just blanks in between. So there's no chapter 50 or whatever that is. So we may refer to a chapter 66, but we don't have 66 chapters in our code. And the, and the codes of the different topics, they, they vary greatly. Um, some of them deal with public safety, so we've got, you know, from the criminal side with our prosecutors and our courts and our police department, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll issue citations, they'll make arrests based on state laws, um, but sometimes they'll do it based on code provisions as well. Chief Solberg yesterday talked about a failure to obey, that someone can be arrested and cited for a failure to obey a lawful order. That's a code provision that we have in place. Um, so we're going to talk about just the process, and I would like to get, the whole point here is to get feedback from the council on how you would like staff to, to deal with um, code changes going forward. And we, you know, we also obviously want to be very responsive to what the council's desires are. Um, so I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through that real quick. I only have just a couple slides. And so, as I talked about, Ordinances, their additions, their modifications to the town code. One of these 21 chapters. Again, zoning ordinances are different. They don't modify our town code. Um, they're they're a different creatures. So we're only talking about these code provisions that are enforceable. They're our version of the law. Um, so let's talk about why why are changes to be made. I mentioned that there's been hundreds and hundreds of additions, updates to the town code since this this version of the town code was adopted in 1984. A lot of times these, these changes are being made because there are updates to state law or new state laws put in place. Uh, we work closely, the attorney's office, with the InterGov team, Rob and his team, um, through a legislative sessions, because every year the legislature passes lots of laws, hundreds of laws, some of which affect cities and towns. And so a lot of times we have to update our ordinances so it conforms with these changes to state law or new laws that are put in place. Um, a lot of times as well, we're, we're making changes to state law because we need to make fixes. We see things that aren't working. Council's giving us direction saying, hey, let's do this, do that. And so that's the other times that we're making changes to these code ordinances. Um, and then the, the next question is who brings it? Our code authorizes 
the town manager, this was mentioned yesterday, the town manager is authorized to bring a code change, uh, the mayor as well, and then three council members. And so that's the process. That's how those come up. And so cities handle code changes differently. State law says, and this is a minimum that all cities and towns have to comply with, that ordinances have to be brought at a public hearing. So all ordinances that are brought in the town of Gilbert will be on the agenda, on a council agenda, the public hearing portion. That's because the public has a right to participate, to speak on any code ordinance, any code change. And that obviously applies to zoning as well, obviously. So we couldn't pass or we couldn't put an ordinance on a consent item and then prohibit the, the public from speaking. That wouldn't be permissible, that'd be illegal. So we always bring ordinances on the public hearing section. That's the minimum standard. Some cities require a study session. Before you bring a code change, you have to have a, a prior public meeting. Some require that there's a first reading in a, in a council meeting, and then in the, a subsequent council member meeting, you can actually take a vote on it. Our code follows state law and just says it's got to be on the public hearing. And so what I'd like to talk about is um, that, that last bullet point, direction for ordinance modifications. I'm interested in what the council wants when we are bringing code changes, um, what you would want us to do. Um, so I'm gonna go to the next slide here where we've got, you have to read them all, but there's a, a number of ordinances that we're recommending um, that be updated, or some of them are new ordinances, some of them are to comply with state law. These are things that we've been kind of just sitting on and waiting in order to have this discussion. Again, Gilbert, traditionally, we would bring an ordinance change We'd put it on an agenda. Council would have that discussion at, at the council meeting and then vote on that. There has been some talk that, hey, that ordinance maybe should have gone to a study session prior to that. It's not required by code. And from a staff perspective, we don't know when council wants to have additional discussion on an ordinance. You know, and so we're looking for direction is what, how do you want us to treat ordinances going forward? Would you want a separate study session for each ordinance? Would you want to continue the practice we've always had where we'll put it on an agenda? That's the public hearing, there's a discussion there. Council can vote to approve, vote to modify, vote to continue to require additional discussion. Um, that's, that's where I really wanna open it up to everyone. We'll go through some of these. Um, the fireworks ordinance, that's a change to state law. We hear a lot of feedback about fireworks a lot of people don't like fireworks. They want the town to ban them. We cannot do that. There's a state law that creates minimum um, protections for fireworks in certain times of the year. Uh, that state law was recently modified, which grants additional authorities to cities to regulate. And so that's something we want to bring to council and see what you want to do. Do you want to keep the status quo with what we have? Do you want to you know, regulate more to the extent that we can? Um, Short-term rental, that's a discussion we're going to have right after this. Again, changes to state law. They had initially restricted much of the ability of cities to regulate short-term rentals. That's now been modified. Some cities have passed new ordinances that are regulating to the extent that the law provides. That's the separate discussion. Um, and then, and a lot of mine, a lot of these are just minor ordinances, things that we're seeing. Some of them are related to the police department where they're having issues, um, not able to issue citations or seeing issues with the courts where we need to update our code. Um, to make it more clean, more easier for the police to do their job. And um, another one that's on there, special events, we're looking at doing an update to some of the special events. So from here, I'd like to turn over to council to have a discussion on how do you want us to bring ordinances to you as a public body going forward? Probably right. How many years have you been with the town now? Uh, my name is Hawken Johansson for, I guess, I have introduced myself to the new members, uh, finance director for the town of Gilbert. I've been with Gilbert, 16 years now in, in December, so oh I God. have... You started with the economic development. <laughs> I spent, a, yeah, it was recently. I can't remember exactly. It's uh, yeah. this month, so... Started with economic development. Yep, I spent some time in economic development, some time in the budget office, um, some... That's... It was 15. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm a little older than that, but... Um, I spent time in water resources and fleet and then uh, the last eight or nine years in finance. Um, so uh, we're excited 
to talk about short-term rentals. It's a hot topic. Um, we started talking about this five or six years ago. Uh, Jordan Fasano in our tax team is, is going to be giving this presentation and has done a, a lot of the work and research behind it. Uh, we had a good dialogue last council retreat, uh, and so we've kind of uh, built on that and a lot of the dialogue that we've had since then. Um, the state continues to make changes every year to what we are allowed to do in terms of regulating this industry uh, and trying to balance uh, the homeowners that are renting out their homes and those that live next to those uh, people. And, and so um, we'll be excited to, to get some feedback and thoughts. Uh, we have just a little bit of history, how we got here, some of the changes, some of the legal restrictions and, and what we are allowed to do. Um, but Jordan's put all that together, so I'll hand it over. Hi, Jordan. Thank you. Before you start, I just want to mention to everyone that um, when you're going to speak or ask questions, to please use your microphones. I know that we're getting some, we're having some comments from folks that they can't hear when questions are being asked. So please remember to do so. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning. Uh, as Hawkins said, my name is Jordan. I work in the tax compliance division. Uh, been here four years. That's how long I've been working on this project for four years. Uh, we had a lot of issues with different legislation and then COVID shut everything down, but we presented last year. This year, it's, it's a different scope. We're going to talk kind of what staff is doing and then where we want some advice from council and where we want to go with the ordinance that we kind of touched on a bunch in the last presentation. Okay. Uh, this is just a quick overview of what we're going to do. I do want to point out when it says GB, that's my tax brain. Uh, we refer to every city and town in their region code that they use when they file their returns. So GB is just Gilbert. Uh, I just am always GB. This, CH, SC, QC, all the different cities and towns. So sorry about that. It's, uh, it's Gilbert there. We'll touch on the old legislation from 2016 and then in 2019 and then the new legislation. We're on a three-year track. Every three years we make changes. Uh, this year has been my favorite changes. Um, not really staff recommendations. That's misleading. It's kind of just our thoughts on where we think we should go as a, as a town. And then again, we want opinions from council to move forward. Okay, so I think it's important to define short term rentals. Uh, a lot of people get mixed up on them. So it's just a property rented out by the owner for 29 days or less. Um, we tax them the same as hotel motels. So if you're 30 days or more, you become a residential rental, long-term rental. If you're 29 days or less per stay, not per month, not in, just per stay, uh, becomes a short-term rental. Most of them, as we know, are listed on online lodging marketplaces. Uh, those are your Airbnbs, your VRBOs, turnkey. Those are the big ones. There's a bunch of small ones. There's some local ones that are Gilbert only. There's a Scottsdale only one. Uh, they're all over the place now, online lodging marketplaces. Um, short-term rentals are not required to list on an online lodging marketplace. They can list them on their own. If you have the facility that people want, you can do it on Facebook, Craigslist, wherever else you can get the word out and, and book it yourself. It doesn't have to be through uh, an OLM. Okay. Current short-term rentals in Gilbert. This is a map that was provided by AirDNA. You can see all the little purple dots here. Those are the short-term rentals. Uh, you can also see on the left here, in 2016, we had 350 in the town. That's approximate. We've met with uh, a ton of different service providers that, that work with local cities and towns on short-term rental monitoring, and they provided us with that number sometime last year. So it, it doubled uh, in the last five, six years. There was a big downturn in 2020 with COVID, uh, not necessarily the houses being sold, just they weren't listed as often. So the data's kind of been climbing back up. You can see we're up in the 700 range now in 2022. Uh, this map is great. It shows us that we do have a lot in Gilbert, a lot of short-term rentals. The problem is it's 30,000 foot. All it does is show us an idea of where they are. None of those purple dots have been verified as a short-term rental. Uh, the verification process, when, you, when we do it or when a service provider does it, it's really intense. We have to take the listings that we get. We have to go on. Uh, to any of the online lodging marketplaces, try and match that house. Most of them don't give you an address until you book. So you have to do a lot of guessing on the area you're in and try and zoom in and then find a listing of that house and match it. Uh, so very high level view right here. Uh, as we work 
uh, with a service provider, which we're heading toward, we will get the actual address information of these and the owner information of these, okay? Okay, currently, Town of Gilbert's Land Development Code does have a requirement for short-term rental registrations, okay? So we do require it right now. It's been very passive. Um, the administrative burden to, like I said, to find and verify a short-term rental and then find the owner, which could be a whole nother process, is just way too overwhelming for me to, to take care of uh, along with my other duties. So uh, right now it's passive. All we require is property owner information, operator information. A lot of the short-term rentals uh, are bought by investors and then somebody else operates that actual rental. So we ask for information on both of them a transaction privilege tax license, and then you have to register it with the county as a rental, okay? So uh, in partnering with a service provider, the, the whole goal is to build out four different areas of the, uh, the short-term rental uh, database, okay? So we wanna locate all these short-term rentals. They will do that, the service provider. They're gonna go out. They're gonna do all that research for us. They're gonna verify that this house that got sent in is actually a rental, okay? We're going to build up a true registration database with all this information, plus a little more, okay? Uh, currently, <laughs> operating in a passive capacity, uh, our database is an Excel spreadsheet on my computer. We have 40 uh, residents registered on there. Mm, half have probably reached out to us to say they have a short-term rental that they want to register. The other half, a concerned resident has asked, hey, or told us, I think this is a short-term rental. And then I go through the research, I reach out to the owner and I get them registered and, and put into the database. The other two things that working with a service provider are gonna provide us with and give us, uh, it's gonna set up a 24 seven hotline for residents so they can call into the number and just, register a complaint, ask if it's a short-term rental, uh, state that it's a short-term rental, uh, talk about an incident, any of that, okay? 24-7, the service provider uh, operates that for us. The fourth thing it does is it is gonna track all incidents and complaints in one place for us now. So right now, we get an email in the tax compliance department. I document that, I talk to the person emailing, I talk to the owner of the property, and I document it. Code compliance gets a, a, a call, they do the same thing. They document it in their database. Police gets a call, they document it in their database. So they're just scattered throughout the town and we have no idea that we've all talked to the same property. This uh, provider is gonna put them all in one area. So if, we, uh, if I get a complaint, I can put it in that database. And then if police gets a call, they can go in and look and see, okay, we, we've, already, we've already handled this. Or if code gets a call, they can see that it's already been handled. Uh, most of them allow unlimited licensing, so as many departments as we need can be uh, logged into them and have access to them, okay? And I think that's the most important uh, to focus on right now is that, um, so uh, my, my back neighbor right behind me is a short-term rental now, uh, and they have the, you know, the spotlights in their backyard. Every once in a while, those lights stay on and they shine right into our bedroom and I'm married to a, uh, a feisty New Yorker who wants to shoot the light out with a BB gun or jump over the wall and move the light. And you know, I have to tell you, you can't do that. You know, I work for the town, don't, don't get us in trouble. Uh, so she can now call into this hotline, tell them, hey, I'm having an incident. Their, their light keeps coming in. It's, it's to no fault of their own. They might've just hit the switch, the renter, and not knowing that it's on or who knows. Uh, so call in, we can call the owner, tell them, can you tilt the light down so it's not shining into the neighbor's yard? Or can you label the switches inside so your renters are turning them off at the end of the night or when they're done out there, any of that stuff. If they, let's say that's on Friday night, she calls in. If on Saturday uh, she calls in uh, again to complain, somebody else looks at it, not me, now it's code looking at it. They can say, oh, okay, it, they've already talked to the owner, the owner just has a Okay, so that's where we're at as staff. We're building out that database now. This is where we need council's input. Back in 2016, SB 1350 was passed. This defined online lodging and online lodging marketplace. It set up the market for what, was, what is now Airbnb, VRBO. They were exploding. This just gave us some definitions. 
It also stated, and I think Chris mentioned this, that we couldn't regulate short-term rentals at the time. There was nothing we could do. We had to leave them alone, let them operate as any other resident in a house would. Okay, And it required that the owner must register the property with the county assessor. That is just stating that it's no longer your primary residence. It's, just, it's, a, res it's a rental residence now. Okay, In 2019, they added in that we could now collect information on the owner or the owner's designee. Again, sometimes the owner and the operator aren't the same person. It gave us the option to hold the owner accountable for verified violations. So if your renter got in any trouble, we can now hold the owner accountable for that to try and prevent uh, repeat offenders. And it set up a civil penalty structure. Okay, these are all still in there. The big thing that came out, if you guys remember in 2019, was that we had to report every verified violation to the Department of Revenue. So we had to, if a renter got cited, we had to track that all the way through the process, which I think Chief said could take six to eight months, maybe a year. We had to find a way to follow that and then tell the Department of Revenue that, yep, there was a verified violation. Now we're gonna enact a penalty. They took that out, it's no longer required. We don't have to do that anymore. They're not involved in the process anymore. Okay. 2022, more legislation was passed. This actually gave us quite a bit to work off of now uh, in, in terms of building out an ordinance, uh, which I think we're heading towards, but wanted council's input on it. The first thing it did, we can now charge a fee for this permit or license. It's no longer just a registration, very passive. We can actively set up a, a fee structure for the permit license. It is supposed to be um, the cost of setting up the license or $250, whichever is less. Okay, the actual fee for setting up a permit or license. The second thing is we can require neighbor notification. So if you're in a single family house, you have to tell those adjacent to, across, and diagonal to you that you're operating a short term rental out of that property in a single family house. And in multifamily, it's everybody on the same building floor. So if you're in building one, floor three, everybody else on that floor in that building has to know that you're operating a short term rental. Okay, we also have to set up some sort of uh, compliance check that the owner would have to go get the neighbors to sign and then bring it back to us to show that they had informed their neighbors they're operating a short-term rental there. The third is advertisement requirements. This is requiring if we do a permit license that they'd have to put that permit or license number in every advertisement for that property. So if it's on Airbnb, put the license number in there. If it's on BRBO, put the license number in there. If you have one house but you rent out four different units, in there that's kind of more popular in the east coast but if you do that each of those would require a different license and each advertisement would require that number to be put in there i think this stemmed from they were requiring uh, transaction privilege tax license numbers to be put in and we treat those numbers like your social security number that is a confidential number uh, when we move back into muni one tax compliance is locked up in our tower we're hidden away so that we can keep all that stuff all that confidential information away from the public and away from other town employees. So they were requiring it to go in the advertisements and the online lodging marketplaces actually were deleting them and saying, why are you putting that in there? So we changed it to the, per or the, the state changed it to the permit license number being required. Jordan, can yes. you explain that again? So if a property has more than one unit on the property, they each have to have a separate number? Yes, they would need a license for each unit that they're operating. So if I own a large property in Gilbert that has a single family home, but it has an attached dwelling unit that has two or three other full functioning um, property, like apartments, we'll say for lack yeah. of a better term, um, each one of those would have to have a separate number to advertise individually. That's how I interpret it, is that? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing is posting at the property. Uh, that is a requirement on the owner operator to post their contact information at the property on the back of the door. I, th I think one of our uh, neighboring cities also is requiring a map of the floor plan, like in a hotel room when they put the map there for egress. Uh, I think they're requiring that in the house too. So we can set up different requirements that they have to post at the actual property. 
It can require liability insurance. Uh, the owner must maintain uh, liability insurance of at least $500,000 uh, unless some of the online lodging marketplaces offer that already. If, they, if they're listing on those, they don't need it themselves. If they are uh, not listing on those, they will need the insurance if it's part of the ordinance. And the last thing is background checks. The owner must perform uh, a background check on the renting guest, not everybody staying in the house, just the one guest actually renting it no later than 24 hours before the stay actually begins, okay? And I think that is uh, specifically a sex offender background check if we go that route. The big thing with all six of these, these, these are all of them that, that we have right now, uh, there's a lot of nuance in, in each of them. There are fee schedules, there's if you don't register within or set up your permit license within 30 days of it going live, there's a fee. Um, there's all sorts of timing, there's penalties. So there's a bunch of nuance in each of those. We just wanted to give you the overview of the six big options that came out of the new legislation. And then for us as town, at the moment, we were leaning toward specifically charging a fee if council wants to go that way and depending on how much you wanna uh, set up that process for, uh, and then requiring the owners to inform their neighbors, that neighborhood notification. Um, again, going back to the, the uh, software uh, vendor there that we talked to, the service provider, if we, uh, are, are partnered with them, we are able to build out a true database and have actual data to bring back if we're having a lot of incidents or, or complaints or issues, if we're seeing them rising and getting to a level of some of our other uh, cities or towns in the area, then we could put more into the ordinance, we could make changes. At the moment, we felt like setting up a, a fee because we do have a standard business license that has a fee and this is a business, that's why it's taxed like a business, it is a transaction. Um, to set that fee up and to, and to have a fee schedule for uh, a permit or a license for short-term rentals, and then just requiring the neighbors, and that's based on just all the information we receive. I know council gets emails, uh, tax compliance, code compliance, police, fire, intergov, everybody gets various emails about, hey, I think this is a short-term rental or I'd like verification, and so now that removes that, that issue for those residents that are concerned, they'll know right off the bat uh, if it's a, a short-term rental in their neighborhood. That's what we had. Any thoughts? Where would you like us to go? What do you want us to bring to you next? I can't. Microphone. Last one. So we'll get together stuff. We'll get a study session, you know, follow up to our prior conversation uh, where council can get more input. Make sure you get the actual draft of the documents beforehand. So we're going to talk about council policies. Um, when I was up here earlier, we talked about ordinances. That's town law, right? Town code. Um, and that's done by ordinance at a public hearing. The councils, and, a lot, and most councils do this, they, they will also adopt policies. And for staff, it's, it's the direction of council. It's, it's not exactly law, but it's something we absolutely follow. Um, and sometimes you want to put a policy in place, but you don't want to make an ordinance out of it. So this is an issue that actually came up at least, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago. Um, I, I had heard the council had a policy, policy in place on, I can't even remember what it was about, and I couldn't find it. And someone's like, no, well, we definitely a council at one point adopted that. So we got looking at this, and then, you know, to me, it, it morphed into a bigger project. It's actually been one of my goals is to kind of wrap my arms around what council policies are. And so we're going to... We're going to go through that right now and make some recommendations. So we'll go through the history of what the council policies are here in Gilbert. Um, we're going to review some of them, um, and then we're going to, I'm looking for direction discussion going forward on those. And so when, when I started looking at these policies, I would try to find one policy, uh, the clerk, as we had talked about, uh, the clerk is the custodian of all records. So I get with the town clerk, and it's like, hey, can we find a policy on this? They ended up finding it. But as I started to dig into it, we, the town doesn't have a repository of where all these policies are, all active council policies. Unlike, you can go to our website, you pull up the town code, and you can find the town code in any code provision. We don't have that with a, when it comes down to council policies. So I asked my paralegal, um, hey, can you work with the clerk's office and let's find all council policies? And it wasn't an easy process. 
And it turns out there's been over 140 policies that have been adopted by the town council since 1957. Most of these were hidden in records and no one knew about them. Um, 130 are currently in effect. Um, some have been repealed formally by council and council action. At least these 130 that are in effect, we don't have a record of any of them ever being uh, repealed or rescinded. And so many of these policies, so what my project was is we, we gathered all the policies and then it's like, okay, let's review these policies and see if they're still current and we want to ultimately bring them to council and get direction on what you want to do with these, we'll make recommendations. So we gathered these 140 policies, determined that 14 were formally repealed. We found records in council meetings that some were repealed, some were updated. Um, and then um, the last thing is, as we went through there, we identified and kind of put them in categories to figure out, okay, these policies apply to human resources, these policies apply to public works, and so we kind of categorize them and organize them. And we'll go through them briefly. Uh, we're not going to read all 140, um, but some are actually pretty, pretty funny if you get into it. So um, here's some examples of some policies we have in effect, right? A 15-minute coffee break in the morning and in the afternoon that all employees are entitled to get. Um, not allowed to firefight outside town limits. Diet Coke, or does it have to be coffee? And it's got to be coffee. It doesn't say any other beverage. It's got to be coffee. Um, so, you know, that's a funny one, okay, you know, but, but we have a policy in effect that gets violated all the time, right? right. No firefighting outside town limits. We have intergovernmental agreements with other agencies where we do. We go out when needed, and those, those, those agreements have been in place for decades and decades, but that policy is still on the books, right? There's a 10% per mile travel reimbursement for employees. So uh, Hawken, you know, don't, don't pay the IRS rate, right? We can only get paid 10%, which, which may cover like one-tenth of the gas costs, much less, right? So these are the type of things that are in there. Employees are entitled to get their day off for their birthday. And, and if, you, if it's not your birthday, then you get a day in your birthday week with your manager approval. We so, have a birthday day off this week because we both had a birthday. <laughs> correct. Yeah. So these are some of the things like, so that one, for example, right, the employee birthday holiday, it's, we have our personnel rules that tell you what days you get off. It talks about vacation, talks about holidays. That's not one of them. So that's was superseded by our town personnel rules, but the policies formally in place. And again, collective bargaining, we, uh, I don't know, 2011, 2012, uh, the town moved away from the merit protection system, covered employees, employees that are hired after that date. With the exception of police and fire, they have their own rules. We're all at will. We're not part of any employee union, so we have collective bargaining. Still a policy on the books, but we're at will employees, so that's not needed. Are the, po <laughs> the, yeah. po are the policy, those numbers are the years these were passed, I'm assuming? Yes, that's correct. So it's the year that's passed and then the policy number of, of that. So those are just some kind of, some of the funny, some of the funnier examples. Um, so in your packets, in your materials, we created the spreadsheet, and this has been something that took a while to gather, to organize, and then each one of the, you know, the attorney's office, we went through and we worked with the different departments. We organized them by department. We got with the departments and said, hey, what are your thoughts? Here's all the policies that we think impact your department, and what are your thoughts on that? Should they be, should these policies stay in place? Should they be updated? Should they be repealed or rescinded? And so you'll see that's the summary um, of all these 140, the vast majority of which the recommendations are to repeal them because they've been superseded by town code, they've been superseded by state law, they've been superseded by personnel rules, by the land development code, and they're just, they're, they're, con they're not just superseded, they're contrary to what our current codes say or our current rules say. And so you look, there's a lot of them in, a, in tons of different categories. And then at the end on that last page, we, even, we included the policies that were repealed. So you can see the ones that were repealed as well. Um, and then the dates that they were repealed. Some were repealed by town code specifically and others by uh, prior 
uh, or subsequent um, council policies. So we've got there, we've got a list and, you know, looking at it, our recommendations are of these 140, well, maybe 130 because some were repealed policies. Our recommendation is that maybe it's 20 or so uh, remain because they're still active. They're still good policy. They haven't been um, superseded by any change in code or statute, but the vast majority um, be repealed. And my recommendation is that council does a formal repeal. So we've got it in the records and the clerk can, can memorialize that. And we know that, that, hey, that policy was in effect, the, the one from 1957, and it was repealed by the council on whatever date. And then for our record books, we know that that is not formally uh, in, in effect. So these are my recommendations, is figuring out what the process would be so council can educate yourselves. If you wanna read all the policies, great. We've got the summary. I can provide links to all the policies. Um, at some point in the future, bring this to council at a formal council meeting where there's a council vote and we, we rescind, we repeal, we update. There are, there are a few in here and you'll see it on that spreadsheet. Um, there are a few that we're recommending be updated and this is you know, input that we got from the departments. Um, that's the first step. And then the second step would be place these policies, all of them, even the ones that have been repealed or rescinded, put them on our website so the council, so staff, and the public knows what the employees are. And then going forward with future town policies, if new ones are created or they get updated, then we update the website so everybody knows what the council policies are. And we, I'd like to figure out how we can tie that into our town code. And because you know, with these policies, you can look at the town code and if you don't know what policies out there, then you don't know that the council has already given direction on something and what we wouldn't want to do as staff is you know, do something contrary to a, a formally council, a formal council proof policy that we didn't even know existed. So this is the whole point is to bring them up there after they get updated. So everyone's aware that they're there. So with that, it, there's a lot of policies, right? I've, I, we've got them all, we can provide links to them all. I'm asking council, how would you like to do this going forward? Because there is so many policies. We could talk about each one, we could, send you a link and have you review them on your own time and then have a study session to talk about whatever ones you want to talk about. So that's looking for the direction on that end. Thank you. Surprise, surprise, the council policy. Um, and we just talked about policies. Yeah, so the, the idea here is we're gonna do a brief review of the code of ethics. Um, it was first passed by the council in 2012 and then revised in 2021. Um, I was asked by the council I think it was earlier this year that, hey, it may be time to revisit. Please bring this to the council, and that's why I'm here today uh, to start the discussion. I'm not proposing any changes. I don't have any drafts to our existing policy. Basically, we'll do a brief discussion about what the policy is, what it covers. We'll take a look at what other cities do. That was what I was asked to do, a survey of other cities, so I've got a table there. I've got more materials that are more in depth that I, I don't have here, but that we can refer to. And then we'll be asking council for direction. If, if revisiting and updating the, the policy is what you want, how do you want to do that? Do we do a subcommittee, a task force, however you want to do that? Um, so just real, real quickly again, the council policy and the a formal name is Code of Ethics for Members of Town Council Boards, Commissions and Committees. That was adopted in 2012, again, amended uh, just over a year ago. The purpose, and th this is the stated purpose in the policy, is to maintain public confidence and integrity of public officials and instill public trust through the actions, words, and deeds of public officials. Um, the policy actually has eight parts, and I'll go over them. There's, there's one part that talks about the responsibilities of public service. There's another one that talks about open meeting law. Um, the open meeting law is what it is. We're all subject to it, whether or not we have a policy. We have some stuff in there, but we're all subject to that anyway. Conflicts of interest, same thing. That's a state law thing. There's a council policy that talks a little more about it. Um, it gets into gifts, talks about confidential information. 
there's a provision on town council relations and other public bodies with other public bodies and agencies, um, code of ethics training requirements, and then there's procedures and then enforcement. Those are the eight sections in our current code of ethics. Here's a survey, I don't know if you can see it, it's in your material. Um, we did a survey of other cities, kind of our sister cities, which are really the biggest, can't remember if we did eight, eight or nine cities. So Phoenix, Tempe, Mesa, Glendale, uh, Avondale, Tucson, Chandler, um, probably leave Scottsdale. We looked at those cities and A, do they have a code of ethics policy or ordinance or resolution that applies to you know, elected officials or appointed officials. Again, we're just talking about that. Town employees were subject to the town personnel rules, so we're in a different category. A lot of the requirements are the same, but these are council adopted imposed rules on elected and appointed officials. So we did that survey. We collected, we collected those. I've got copies of all those. And these are kind of what you see in here is a highlight of some of the main provisions that they have. And then at the end, we have a number showing, okay, how many cities do this and how many have this? And so these are the, I think they all have, they all have something and some form of something. Um, and then, so we, I'll go through these just really briefly. Um, the filing process, it varies. Some like the town says you file it with, ours is the town clerk, some say, the, the town attorney or city attorney, then you got anyone can file a complaint. That's dealing with who has standing to file a complaint. Our code is anyone can file a complaint, uh, any, any council member, any employee, any resident, any non-resident, anyone can file a complaint. Some restrict it and says, well, only, the, uh, only residents can file a complaint. And some say, well, no, only a council member can do so. Now, if a resident wants a complaint, they can hit a council member up, and if they convince the council member to file that, then you do that. So there's four that say anyone can file a complaint, and then there's the four that filing restricted to employees or officials themselves. Um, we talk about some have time limits, right? Um, and the, the idea behind that is basically there's a statute of limitations. If I file something against a council member for something I say they did you know, three years ago, Ours doesn't have a time limit. Some have time limits saying, hey, it's got to be something within 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever that number is. Otherwise, you're time barred. Um, some of these have a, that deem it being an ethical violation to bring a frivolous claim. So there's a process where people determine whether or not the claim was frivolous. And if it was, and it was a council member that brought it, then that itself is a, is a violation. Um, and so we get through here. Three have some type of ethics commission, um, which, which is a public standing body. Two are independent commissions, which means the council approves an ethics commission, and they're the ones that take complaints. They're the ones that decide complaints and then make the recommendations. Um, and then one of them has that ethics commission is made up some of council members themselves. Um, we all have different enforcement here. Uh, different methods of enfor enforcement, investigation. Uh, then you see what the penalties are. Um, you see, uh, you know, reprimand censure, that's what ours is. That's the ultimate penalty. Uh, commissioners, um, this is re removal of commissioners. These are appointed. Our code's different. Um, the town council in our code, not in this policy, but in our code, the town council can remove an appointed member of a public body at any time. And so um, if council wanted to address boards and commissioners removal in the policy, we would have to update the code. I like that it's in the code because they are appointed at your discretion and you should retain the right to remove a, a, an appointed member at any time. Um, you see the one that talks about removal from elected office and that's for charter violations. I talked when I talked earlier briefly about the town being a general law city. Um, we don't have a city charter which is our own set of rules, right? And so some cities that have charters, uh, there are ways to remove council members because it's in the charter. Title IX that we're subject to doesn't have that. The only way to remove a council member is through a recall process. Um, again, some mandatory trainees, monetary fines, 
Um, and then at the at the end, you talk about some of these applies to elected officials. All of them do that. Some get into boards and commission of board members. Most do. Ours does. Um, three are enacted via an ordinance. Most are via some type of policy statement, like like we have or a resolution. Most of them have a statement of purpose. They talk about open meeting laws, and and the rest conflicts of interest. So that's really what are the most common things that we're seeing in code of ethics policies and code of ethics um, ordinances. And again, I've got all the different policies from all the different cities of council members. If you want me to get you access to that, I'll give it to you um, so you can look at it and kind of formulate. So the last thing I have is a I'll turn it back over to council. Um, do you do you think it's time to revisit to update the code of ethics? And if so, how do you want that done? Well, I can make this fast. You don't have to ask any questions and we'll move right on. So, no, I'm Melanie Dykstra. I am the Volunteering Community Resources Manager and I'm one of the staff liaison to the Community Engagement Task Force. So Dawn and I are here to just give a little report out on the status of the group. So good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. So just a, I know some of you are new to the group here, so just a little bit of history of this task force. In 20 and 21, um, council identified the need to explore some of our critical community issues. They had done a lot of listening sessions and then directed staff in the spring of 21 to start exploring the creation of a community engagement task force in order to bring some of those voices forward and make sure that we're hearing them as an organization and that council understood what was happening in the community. So on January 25th, the council did appoint nine members and two alternates, and they are appointed for a beginning service of two years. It is a task force versus a board commission um, or committee. Um, it does function under the public meeting laws and all of the same rules and regulations, but it is designed right now as a short-term objective for this group. And the first meeting got kicked off March 7th um, for them. And they were tasked with kind of looking at some critical um, areas as designated by council, and that is domestic violence, mental health and suicide prevention, homelessness and low-income challenges, human and sex trafficking, and ensuring Gilbert is a kind and welcoming community. So those were kind of the five pillars that they were um, to kind of explore, look at, and make some recommendations to council. So part of this journey, the way it was to make sure that they were, had um, some information, we wanted to include board member training for them since it was a new group group, as well as education on the issues, so they knew kind of where we are and what we're doing. And then they were to hone in on a, a first focus area. Um, since five, those five areas are pretty big areas, there's a lot of information that goes along with those. We did feel like it was important that they tackle one at a time. So what we did for training, just so that you're aware, is they also had open meeting law training because again, they function under the same rules and regulations that all of our boards and commissions do. They had um, strengths training, they did disc training, civil discourse and difficult topics. They did some DNI workshop as well as trauma informed. And part of this was to make sure that they got to know each other, their strengths, how to work together, how to come to consensus on items, as well as how to work with the community. So we knew that community may come and make some, um, have an opportunity to make comments and they wanted to make sure that they knew how to listen and understand the issues out there. So that's a lot of the training that we did with them. So once that was completed, we then wanted to make sure we brought some informational items to them, give them education on really what is already the town doing, what efforts that we already have in place, uh, making sure that they're aware of how we're working in each of those areas. And that gives them an idea of where our gaps are. That's how they get to form some recommendations because they want to make sure we already know what exists in our department. So as you can see, um, for community resources, we went over the 2019 needs assessment, which was really a very um, strong focus area to make sure we knew and we had had a consultant work in the community to make sure we understood some of the issues, um, but then also the understanding what other resources we're putting out there. Same with, we had the police department um, and there have been some new programs that had come forward through there, but they work a lot, again, in community engagement and how they're interacting with our um, residents as well. And then the fire department, we wanted to make sure we highlighted some of the programs they were doing as well. So they got all of that information to understand kind of what's going on and what we have to date. 
Uh, we also wanted to make sure that they were aware of some of the other things that we had already promoted throughout the community to get information on. Again, that was relative to these five critical areas. So one of them was the community inclusivity needs assessment. So they got a presentation on those results, as well as we had done an assessment of our homeless population and at-risk population. So I wanted to make sure those they had that information, statistics, because again, as they're trying to delve into one focus area, where is the most need, what are they hearing, where are the gaps? So those assessments were really important to hear about. They also had a mental health first aid presentation, which gave them um, an idea of what we're focused on the town or what those options are as well. So after all of that education, the group did actually take a survey to see if there was a consensus around one item. And what was interesting is that uh, we did have a strong 36% who said um, that they wanted homelessness. That was kind of the, the leading number one choice. But when we had some more discussion, what we found is that 66% actually honed in on the mental health and suicide prevention. That was 66% of the entire committee's second choice. And after further discussion and really vetting through that, they realized that mental health and suicide prevention touches really all of the other critical areas. So we know mental health can have an impact on the homeless and low income challenges. We know mental health has an impact with domestic violence. So they felt like this would be a really good first topic area to kind of delve into do a deep dive and understand more of where our gaps and where they can make some action item recommendations. So that is the first one that we are focusing on. So after they kind of created that um, interest area, we realized that we still had some information that they needed to be aware of. And so by the request of the task force, they said, you know, we wanna make sure we understand what's already happening in the community around this area. Cause it's not necessarily the town's full focus, you know, for mental health and suicide prevention. There's a lot of other groups that are doing that. So we brought in a presentation from 211, who again is that main number that you can call and get connected to some resources. But we also heard from Gilbert Public Schools and Higley Public Schools because they are very, very much in the weeds on making sure they recognize the issues that are going on within our student population as well as with the families. And so they gave some excellent presentations on what the schools are doing, how they work through those issues, what their steps are, making sure their teachers are informed, and the steps they work with students. So they were really aware of what's happening in that um, area. But we also heard from our task force, they said, you know, it's this, this happens to every um, demographic. It's not just kids. It's not just, um, you know, middle. It, it's also seniors. And what, what does that look like? And so we brought in Area Agency on Aging, who actually has eldervention services, suicide prevention for seniors, just to make sure, again, that there's an awareness of what's already out in the community. We don't want them to move forward with recommendations or action items that are already happening, things that are already duplication. How can we enhance what's already happening out there? So we wanted to make sure that they had that. So that just actually happened at our November meeting. So you are now caught up basically to date as to where we've been. So where we are today, and just some of the things that have already been implemented um, just kind of throughout the time that this started is around mental health and suicide prevention. I just wanted to highlight that we have started our crisis care team here in Gilbert, and I think most of you have heard about that. That's a, a unit group out of Chief Solberg's area in the police department that really is helping us respond to some of those mental health issues helping fill that gap and with some follow-up as well. So that's one of the pieces we're working on. Um, having the police department also being autism certified really helps to make sure that we're aware of how we're working with our community. And we actually in the community resources area have made an effort to promote 988 and 211. Um, our social media group, the digital government really um, put out some information on that, but we pro put out a small resource card as well as a larger manual. And we're highlighting that with a QR our code and making sure that that number is very visible. So those things that we had heard, you know, are important. But our next steps, and we are having our December meeting on Monday um, here at the library as well, and that is going to be their opportunity to really now put pen to paper and really kind of decide what everything they've heard, what they've seen, what they think is still out there in their conversations with the community, what do we still need to do? So that's what's happening on Monday. And we are fortunate that Kathleen Dowler from Dignity Health is actually gonna come in and help facilitate that. Um, we're utilizing a template that they've um, had success with over in theirs where they kind of get to highlight strategies um, and ideas around these program areas. So we're really looking forward to Monday and getting them to really kind of put those ideas out there 
there and make sure we're capturing those. And we'll probably be working on that for a meeting or two to make sure that they have everything covered and we've captured what they look like. And then after that, then we'll kind of hop back to the drawing board to say, hey, what's the next topic that you guys want to take? So with that in mind, what I, yes, Sorry. Well, what one of the asks that we just had today after you've heard all of this is because they are tackling those five areas and they will be uh, making some suggestions and some recommendations is the question is, um, would council prefer that we come with some of that information after um, maybe they've settled on some action items for each of the areas or when we conclude all five areas. So that's kind of something to think about. And if you're able to provide any feedback, um, that's kind of what we're looking for today. But none of my hands didn't on. And if I might add, um, so like all of our boards and commissions and task force and committees, we do have a council support council champion um, and that would be council member Tilke. She's been super helpful in leading um, this effort with the committee. And so thank you to her and, um, and she's been through the whole process. And so she absolutely can answer questions and give feedback on how the, how the task force is doing or or those types of things as well. So just wanted to make sure we mention that. With that, any questions? I got because you were coming up to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> personally. Okay, Council Communication Subcommittee update, and I'll try to pick up a little time here. So the subcommittee met a couple weeks ago to talk about the initial scope of work and the path forward. And so today we'll just be seeking uh, to answer any questions you may have and any additional input um, you may want to provide before the committee kicks things off in earnest. So the objectives for today is to look at our scope of work, the focus areas, community outreach and engagement efforts that we felt like were a very um, important part of this process. And then the deadline for final recommendations. And the committee put together um, uh, a statement around the uh, scope of work that I'll read to you to explore policies, best practices, and other resources to help promote civility and the navigation of challenging issues by designing public meetings and outreach efforts that balance community objectives while enhancing public participation through two-way communication and governance policies. That was fast. Yes. <laughs> Putting that together was not as fast. No, we sure. worked Smith that well, quite a bit. Well. I'm going to give you credit. You read it very well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so for the scope of work, first we wanted to identify the focus areas. In this area, the subcommittee will examine town meeting practices for opportunities within our existing framework. Outreach and engagement subcommittee will review current strategies and identify practices for enhanced communications with the public. And recommendations to council upon completion of the first two categories, subcommittee will develop recommendations for council consideration to various changes to uh, town codes and policies and, and uh, practices. So the recommended focus areas, uh, starting with town meetings, looking at creating a consistent format and training for those meetings. So the staff that support those, those bodies, as well as the people who get appointed to that, receive adequate training so that we have a very consistent approach to how we handle those. Have a clear understanding of the attorney's role, and which is a little different depending on the body itself and how active the attorney is in, that, in those meetings and processes. Communication from citizens, procedures, rules, staff follow-up, again, to just understand within all of our different bodies how citizens can engage with those boards and commissions, uh, and to the extent possible, um, because some, such as our board meetings by code, allow for public input and comment, and others um, are less formal. So just understand that, and as much as possible, again, create consistency across those various bodies. And then calls, emails to council on agendas items, consistent practices, opportunities for streamlining of processes. Items requiring public notification, again, review codes, local codes and state statutes and the requirements around that and look for opportunities um, for enhancements on that. But uh, radius, time frame and format of uh, notifications, signs, access to notifications, appearance, ease and finding, consistency in web pages, opportunities to create opt-in type of um, opportunities, uh, postcards, and et cetera. Uh, 
two-way communication and, and again here really do a lot of work and a very thorough job of understanding what are we doing today um, for each of these areas, each process, um, but create an inventory of current practices, statutory, codified, and formal pop-up meetings, town hall meetings, HOA meetings, opportunities for council member uh, office hours, council chats, um, just explore all the different ways we can have uh, formal and informal communication with our residents on various issues, whether it be something coming up on an agenda at planning and zoning or at the council, or whether this is just something more informal in nature with things that come up in the community and questions they may have. And to uh, look at how we tell our story, communications outside of social media, how to keep so social media a safe place, opt-in type of system for notifications. Right now we do that for agendas, we do that for board openings, we do that with our newsletter, uh, job opportunities, but just evaluate all those different types of opt-in systems we have and ways in which we can maximize that. And then connecting the dots of our services and what they mean to the citizen. Um, and then under community outreach and engagement, again, understand our best practices for communication and messaging, engagement surveys, weekly email newsletters, town halls, water, sewer, solid waste bill. We have an insert that goes into that bill each month and, and we have not utilized that up to this point as another tool or channel for communication with residents. The media, which has always been uh, a key way of communicating with the general public and, and continues to be in ways in which we can strengthen our media relationships and contacts. It's, it's been challenging. I know that Dana could probably tell you, I don't even know, I don't even know who our AZ Central reporter is right now, but we've probably had eight in, in the 11 years I've been here, um, which creates challenges for us, but just look for opportunities to um, maintain strong media uh, contacts. And look at things like signs with QR codes, ways to simplify residents getting information on things of importance to them, um, digital flyers. And this is not, this is just uh, brainstorming that we did. There's probably a lot of things on here that uh, we didn't think of in that moment, uh, but would be part of this, this subcommittee's um, task of evaluating all those different ways, what we're doing and, and what we could do and maybe what we could change up a little bit. And then the timeline for final recommendations to council, the thought was that uh, we would report out at that combined retreat sometime in the spring of 2023. And another thing the subcommittee uh, made a, a specific point of is to have at least two months of community outreach and citizen input with this subcommittee so that they can have their voices heard about things that they may have frustrations with, things that they don't understand, so that we can do a better job of, of maybe meeting their expectations when it comes to communication and engagement with them, but have a very, very robust and, and lengthy period of citizen input with this subcommittee so that we really can understand where they're at and, and where they'd like us to be and what's possible. So the next steps would be um, work on the scope of work and focus areas, begin that community outreach, develop the recommendations that would come back to council and then present to council at the combined retreat in the spring for potential um, adoption of new policies, modifications to our codes, uh, new business practices for us and, and new ways of, of handling this to the benefit of our community. I went through that quick, so now I'll open it up to any questions. And Councilman Tilke, Councilman Kaprowski, and Councilman-elect Bongiovanni are on that uh, subcommittee. I think alike. All right. Afternoon, Mayor and Council. So in Gilbert, as you know, we are incredibly fortunate to have a very strong base of community support for both our local government and specifically for our police department. In previous and also in the most recent national citizen survey, Gilbert was ranked number one amongst our peer communities in a number of categories, including overall quality of life, residents' sense of community, citizens overall feeling of safety with regard to violent crime and also with property crime and even more specifically than that 92 percent of our residents 
reported an overall feeling of safety in Gilbert, um, overall putting us in a top category. So like I said, we are very fortunate, but using the word fortunate implies luck. And as you all know, you've, many of you have been involved in leadership in the community for a long time. This wasn't luck. Just like Mayor Lewis used to reference the Heritage District as a 30-year overnight success, the strong base of community support for the town of Gilbert and for public safety specifically is not an accident. It's the result of a long-standing commitment and dedication to both community engagement and also community policing. However, this commitment is a never-ending work in progress. There is no end date to that. And so this morning, we want to share with you an initiative that Chief Solberg and his team have been working on for the past year and a half plus, and that is a police department transparency roadmap. Um, we're going to talk about why it was created and then what's gone into developing it and launching it what we've accomplished to date, and then what lies ahead. But before I go too much further, and I'm sure you're gonna do this, we do need to give a shout out to Chief Solberg's incredible leadership team within the police department um, with Levi Leba, Brenda Carrasco, who's on Dana's team. Um, there's a number of individuals, Sharon Castronova, um, who have contributed to this effort, and they've done a phenomenal job. And a lot of the work that you're seeing here is, is a result of their efforts. So just a quick shout out to them. So. Why a PD transparency roadmap? As discussed in previous council retreats, Gilbert was not immune to the social unrest that unfolded across the nation follow in 2020 following the murder of George Floyd. There were cities across the country that saw their communities clamoring for change, and a lot of those communities focused on law enforcement departments with calls for policy changes, demands for increased transparency, increased partnership and engagement. In response, Mayor Daniels at the time held listening sessions in the fall of 2020, and they were highly impactful. The town received a lot of very useful and meaningful direct feedback from Gilbert residents, and community partners about their perceptions of our community and what they would like to see. A lot of that feedback focused on our own local police department. And the feedback wasn't necessarily about what the police department might have been doing wrong. It was more of how can we continue to do things better? How can we improve and take things that are working and build upon that? And so those listening sessions, in addition to being a catalyst for the community engagement task force, they were also a catalyst for this initiative from Chief Solberg in terms of the creation and the launch of the PD Transparency Roadmap. And as you will see in the coming slides, this roadmap serves as a framework for multiple initiatives within the police department with the goal of continuing to build upon the trust and support um, and faith that the community has in Gilbert Police Department. So with that, Chief Solberg. Thank you. Great introduction. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Um, when we were first tasked with doing the transparency roadmap, I figured, all right, it's really easy because we've been doing it for 20 plus years. And in essence, it is, but um, like when we had the, with the listening sessions and we were discussing that with the media and, and with the, the groups that attended, as good as you are or as good as you think you are, you're probably not that good. You always need to make sure you're looking at under a microscope of what you're doing and looking for ways of improving. Um, is what you're doing still a valid way of doing it? Are there better ways of doing it? Are you reaching everyone in the community? Who else can you reach out to that you're missing? So what went, what went into creating the transparency roadmap was uh, we had 12 different groups, and I'll read these real quick, and then I'll highlight some. Uh, we looked at our policies. We looked at our critical incident reviews, um, our use of deadly force, our use of force, uh, our hiring and recruiting, our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives, our chiefs forums, our monthly engagements, uh, get to know Gilbert PD, uh, social media, which I'll talk about, um, our citizen police academy, we do an employee police academy, our Gilbert Youth Leadership Academy, um, our outreach to special needs groups, and then our outreach to nonprofit groups. So focusing specifically on some of those that I just mentioned, <clears throat> the PD policies, we, We've been always very transparent with our policies and our data. Uh, we have a lot of data, a lot of reports, but we created a uh, transparency portal, if you will, uh, similar to what we have with Alex with all the data that you can obtain. 
we created a page that had all our policies and we have a system called Power DMS in which we manage all of our policies in it. Well, there's a public portal to that to where we can post all of our policies online. So now if someone wants to see our policies, they're all posted on there. All of them except for about 10 to 15 policies that are more that are uh, restricted based on uh, like active shooter policies, some of our SWAT policies, our undercover policies, those are not posted publicly, but everything else is. So everything is an open book for us. Those others are available, but with restrictions of we'll take out what we don't want the public to see because it reveals some tactics. Um, so um, along with that uh, PD policies, we created uh, FAQs. So there's a lot of questions and answers on there that we were getting back in 2020 and and Prior to that, and specifically during those listening sessions, we tried answering all those questions. Uh, the community engagement and events, um, we made a commitment to keep hosting those monthly. We do Coffee with a Cop. Um, we did Coffee with a Cop on Wednesday this week. Uh, yeah, this week. And then uh, next week we have, uh, what is it, uh, some funky thing. It's like Coffee Froyo and something. Coco Froyo and... Yeah, with a cop. So those are easy to do. It's good because we try to go to the local businesses, get them engaged. We get a we vary when we do those events. We get a lot of kids. We get a lot of adults. We get a lot of group, what I call groupies that they they come every month. They just want to talk to us. They want to know what's going on, and uh, it's a great way for us to. Um, we bring the motorcycles. We bring the police cars. We bring our gear, uh, just dressed normal and uh, patrol officers. It's a good way to interact with the community. Our quarterly chiefs forums, that's a uh, group. We have a specific list. I think we have 72, 73 people on that list currently. If anyone wants on, they can. They just got to send us an email and we will add them to that group. Um, we, we were meeting online during COVID, but we're back to in-person. We were in-person before COVID. And that's a, an opportunity for us to give updates on what's going on in the police department, ask any questions, get input from the community. Um, a lot of our nonprofit groups, our hospitals, our schools, um, our uh, the East Valley NAACP, the East Valley Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, a lot of our groups belong to this and they will attend those meetings and it's an open forum that we can get more into issues. Where Coffee with the Cop is more just general PR, getting to know each other, but the Chiefs Quarterly Forums will talk about issues and we'll talk about what our, uh, our projects are and our objectives are. The public data, I mentioned the policies. We, uh, on that uh, transparency page, we have all of our PDFs attached there. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, performance management, um, where CompStat type style, we're trying to automate some of those reports this year. Uh, we just started performance management for PD, where we'll be focusing on specific goals and getting those live. So it's like Alex, where you've got the data, you can uh, get in there, you can see the, the data, you can uh, turn off and on. What I envision eventually we'll have, you, you wanna know what's going on in your neighborhood, you can turn on burglaries, vehicle burglaries, um, assaults, you can click amongst that. So we're working on getting that public data, getting it more uh, available. It's there now, it's just in PDF form. And then hiring and recruiting. I'll get a little bit deeper in this in a minute, so I'll just do this real quick. Focusing on um, expanding our net, so to speak, making sure we got good candidates coming in, focusing on our process and streamlining where we can, not compromising standards at, at any point, making sure that everyone has a, the same chance of getting through, but focusing on how do we improve that process. And then that goes hand in hand with the DE and I objectives. For DE and I, we're looking at in service, our new hires, how are we how are we recruiting, how are are we retaining people, but also community, making sure we're uh, getting in touch with the community and through our chiefs forums and all of our uh, associations that we have, um, we attend every month, we have two or three different meetings between the HOAs, uh, Arizona Muslim with Police Advisory Board, uh, a lot of the nonprofits, I'm on the Ascend Board, uh, I've got relations with the United Food Bank, so we have a lot of outreach that we do throughout the community. All right, the interdepartmental collaboration. As I mentioned, we had those 12 groups, so we brought in subgroups and we looked at what we're doing, what aren't we doing, what can we do, what can we do more, but then besides just looking at PD, we also looked at fire, sorry, not fire. We looked at other departments within the town, fire being one and parks and rec, which quickly jumped on with the autism, and I'll talk about autism here in a second. 
Uh, but we were looking at what, what can we do, but also who can we bring with us to help us engage. Um, when we do our uh, Coffee with the Cop, those are great opportunities for you guys to join us, meet the community. Uh, it's They love hearing from us, but they love seeing you guys as well. So feel free to tag along anytime we do any of these events, we put them on social media, feel free to show up. Uh, we wanted to develop a, a simple, to the point, purpose statement, and I drafted one up that was about a paragraph, and we was like, no, 10 words or less. And so thank you for the challenge, because it actually makes it very simple. Building community trust through transparency, education, and engagement. It's very simple. We want to engage the community, and this is how we're going to do it. So I mentioned the transparency web, web, tra sorry, transparency web page where we have all our information. And then we came up with this new tagline, uh, get to know Gilbert PD. So our intent is every two weeks to put out a new story, which gives some insight via social media with that uh, logo there, you'll see it. Uh, we did it with the women in policing. We did it with the crisis response team um, and soliciting information. We, we've got a long list of about 60, 70 different things that we can do. And so we're gonna try to get some insight as to what do we do? How do we do it? What should I do on a traffic stop? What happens when I call 911? We mentioned the eight can't wait, the policies that deal with use of force and, and the oversight. So we have a lot of things planned. So you'll see that about every other week come out on social media. All right, initiatives launched and ongoing. I mentioned the autism program. Uh, we partnered with uh, IBCCES, which is the International Board of Credentialing and Continuing Education Standards. You can see why they go with the IBCCES. It's a very long name. Uh, but they are a national organization, and uh, you, they provide online training for your staff. We put our staff through, so all of our police officers, our detention and our teleserve and dispatch went through training online once we completed that we became uh, autism certified we didn't want to just complete that and say all right we're, we're autism certified we're done we've taken that and have really expanded it um, and i mentioned that and i mentioned fire and parks and rec fire has completed their or about to uh, just started their certification on parks and rec is really close to being done and i think their facilities are done because you can actually certify your people and your place. And so Parks and Rec is a little bit more difficult, a little more work, but um, that was something when I talk about working with other departments, we brought others along with us along this journey. Um, if you know where LIFE, the Lawrence Institute for Education, just south of the police station on Civic Center, we partnered with them. We've got a lot of our employees actually that, that have kids there. And so we partnered with them. They've been great to work with. Um, at the end of the academy, we take our recruits and they spend about a half a day with the uh, students there. And those students are anywhere from kindergartners all the way up to 20, 23, 25 years old. And so we will spend um, a half day and they'll rotate with the younger kids, the teenagers, the adults, so they can get a little bit of uh, real world perspective of how they, uh, those with autistic, um, uh, how they interact with them things and you can see the difference within the class everyone's different just like us everyone is different and so they have the opportunity to interact and vice versa it gives those students the opportunity to, to realize that we're here to help what to do when uh, they need help and along that line we are just about to start this we're working on the protocols for it but a dispatch 911 we're going to be working with them on to teach the kids how to call 911 what happens when you call what questions are they going to ask what uh, type of response uh, do they need to give and then we're working on a traffic stop certification or preparation so the idea is that we would put the the parents and this and the students through a for the drivers uh, in uh, put them through a traffic stop and so they know what to do what not to do what kind of questions we're gonna ask what the way we're gonna walk up to the car why we're doing what we're doing so that they understand and the idea being that we're thinking we'll give them a sticker that they could put on the back of the car or on the window so that we can recognize that this person, that there's probably someone in there that's autistic and also recognize that they've been through the training and give us something to talk to them about and put them at ease. So that's just starting. And then the Sensory Awareness Family Event, as far as we know, it was the first one in the nation. We, we partnered up with Trader Joe's. Uh, they were very good. 
um, like what what Parks and Rec has done with some of their events with a low noise, low light uh, type of a situation. We did the same thing with uh, life with the school. <clears throat> Excuse me. They uh, brought their students out. They turned down the music in the store. They tried to calm it down as much as possible. It was still busy, um, but it, it was a really great event. We had a lot of good uh, feedback from that. There was actually an autistic group out in Phoenix that saw this post it, and so they brought a busload of uh, older uh, kids and young adults uh, to this as well. And we just walked them through. They did it like a almost like a scavenger hunt, but trying to show them how to shop for for food. A lot of them they get overloaded uh, when they go into the grocery stores, and so it was an opportunity in a safe environment for them to learn how to shop. Uh, and then social media, uh, we really rely on social media uh, to get the communication out about what we're doing, all of our special events, and that's uh, most of our interaction, other than face to face out on patrol. So this was just one of the pictures from the event, some of the feedback that we got online. We got a lot of really positive feedback. Uh, I'll read it to you real quick. I love our town, our police department, and Trader Joe's for making our community feel inclusive and supportive. I wish my family could have been there, but hopefully next year. You have no idea how much this means to those special needs families out there. Uh, this is wonderful. Thank you, Trader Joe's and Gilbert PD. As a mom with an autistic son, this means so much to me. Uh, that was just two examples of a lot of very positive feedback we received. And I forgot to mention, um, Fire was with us as well. Sorry, Rob. Um, Fire joined us as well. They brought out a couple of trucks and were out there uh, with us helping out as well. All right, our 30 by 30 program. Um, this is our program that focuses, the goal is by 2030, and this is a nationwide, not just us, that 30% uh, of law enforcement of police officers would be female officers. Right now we're right around 12%. It ebbs and flows as people get hired and retire. Um, but the goal is to increase that by 30%. There's a lot of studies that show women communicate better than men, if you can believe that. Um, my wife reminds me of that all the time. They do, and Leah. Um, but we really want to invest um, in, in our female workforce. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not that we're giving any preferential treatment. It's just throwing that net out there and trying, like what we talked about yesterday with the Aspire event, we're trying to encourage females to get into law enforcement. They don't have to be police officers if they don't want to. There's a lot of opportunities that we have uh, to work within the police department besides just being a police officer. But specifically, we are looking at um, at the police department uh, at Sworn. Um, if you have the live version, um, you can hit that link and it'll take you to our, we have a page dedicated just to this program. I'm gonna play a short little video. I don't know if I can do it or if you guys have to do it. I'll let it play and I'll explain a little bit. Okay, got it. While it's thinking, um, Gilbert PD, Chandler PD, uh, Queen Creek, and Mesa all partnered together. Do I need to do something? Um, all partnered together to do a recruiting video. All of us are part of the 30 by 30 initiative, and we actually didn't have to pay for this, so it was very nice. Uh, Mesa paid for it. Go ahead. Let's talk about 30 by 30. This is a nationwide initiative to bring the amount of women police officers to 30% by the year 2030. We need to show that women are as capable as being police officers as men, and in some instances, they may be even better. And I think it's important that we let our communities know that we always hire the most qualified people, not just based on gender. That's true, but we definitely need more women in law enforcement, and we should talk about why. Well, for one, women are less likely to use force. Typically, women are smaller than men, so we really rely on our de-escalation tactics to get people to cooperate with us. Also, women who are victims of sex crimes and violence are often more comfortable talking to other women. Think about it, half of our population is women. So if we increase the amount of women in law enforcement, it better reflects the communities we all live in. Speaking of community, women can improve the relationships that we have with law enforcement because they reflect the community that they serve. So women bring a very unique and valuable set of skills to the profession. I think it's very important in this profession that we foster community relations and help build community trust. And don't forget about our excellent problem solving skills. Overall, increasing the amount of women in a police agency allows the workforce to be more diverse, effective, and really creative. And at the end of the day, that's what's best for the community. 
Thank you. I said Chandler it was actually Tempe. So sorry to Tempe. Uh, so that's just one example of one of the things we've done to uh, increase our diversity within our workforce. I mentioned that uh, Mesa had a grant and they actually uh, helped pay for that for all four of us, but we were all able to use, use that video for our recruiting. Uh, some of the feedback we got online uh, after we posted that, uh, the women in Gilbert Police Department are from not phenomenal uh, police officers. They all do a great job. And uh, this is awesome. We need you ladies. Um, another uh, project that uh, stemmed from this was our crisis response team. And this goes hand in hand with what the community engagement task force just talked about. <clears throat> in this year's budget in FY23, we were able to start a crisis response team. We have a high number of incidents of people in mental health crisis. And so we wanted to launch this team, uh, which gives freeze up patrol so they can focus on the crime that's occurring. And these, these folks will focus on the men mental health detainers responding to, to calls for service of uh, people who are in crisis, threatening, uh, hurting, thinking about hurting themselves or actually hurting themselves. And um, so there's currently two, there's eventually will be four, the big guy there, Dakota and uh, Calissa Wilkerson, they're there now. And then the other two uh, will be joining them at the end of the year once we get our class two off of training. So eventually there'll be four officers and a sergeant. Uh, so we launched some uh, social media uh, posts about this, a video, and then uh, several news stories picked it up. And here's just where they were interviewing uh, Calissa. And um, one of the, <clears throat> uh, they saw, there was a gal that called us, actually emailed um, the, the email address we have for the community engagement, sorry, the crisis response team, and said that she was thinking about killing herself. She just happened to see our social media post and our video, and she reached out for help. And so they went out there, helped her, talked to her, got her some help, got her the resources she needed. In the first eight weeks that they were operational, they responded to 340 calls for service. They took 53 reports, did 32 pickup orders. Those are the mental health detainers. Uh, they made two arrests. And uh, all of that time spent by those three, the sergeant and the two officers equated to 203 hours and 41 minutes that would have been assigned to patrol officers. So think with, with just eight weeks with three of them, we had two more, that's gonna get even more uh, higher. And you'll hear it a little bit uh, in the next presentation of how we're gonna, looking to supplement that. Uh, but it's been a, a really great adventure, um, good for the community. A um, couple of comments we got online, as a former mobile crisis counselor, I know this is needed. It will also allow patrol units to operate more efficiently. Well done, Gilbert PD. I'm happy my tax dollars are being used in this way. This is fantastic, we needed this and you did it, thank you so much. So a lot of good feedback. All right, I'll hit this one really quick because we're running out of time. Human trafficking, um, we added, uh, we've been focusing on this and uh, Councilman September stepped out, but I think Mayor, you're still on the vast, the Valley Against Sex Trafficking, which is run uh, in the East Valley through the Mesa Chamber of Commerce, uh, focusing on human trafficking. Um, you'll hear a lot about human trafficking over the next three months because the Super Bowl and the Waste Management Open is coming to the Valley and human trafficking follows tourism. And so whenever there's a, a Super Bowl or a large event, there is a lot of human trafficking going on. And so you'll hear a lot um, from the FBI, from us, from all the local agencies. You'll see every couple months um, media stories about online stings. Um, the days of prostitutes walking the street for the most part are gone. They're still out there occasionally, um, but they're, most of it went online. And the more disturbing part is um, the focus on child and children and teens. Um, it happens all the time. And when we do those operations, they get so many people in line waiting to uh, uh, connect, if you will, with one of our victims that they have to turn the lines off and because it's just too much for us to handle. So we uh, wanted to participate in that more. So we dedicated an officer to a detective that will be assigned to the human, human trafficking task force with the FBI, which that gives us the ability to bring in all those resources with the Valley task force and the FBI. So if we have a case in Gilbert, it comes with about 20 people. And then when we don't have something in Gilbert, they're assisting throughout the Valley with those cases. So that's something we'll look at expanding as we get our foothold in there. Um, it takes a little bit. Uh, that detective will actually start this month. Took about four or five months to get the background checks done. 
I mentioned VAST, the Valley Against uh, Sex Trafficking. I actually had a typo on that, sorry about that. And then Trust AZ is a statewide uh, organization that provides training. Uh, not in our city, uh, Night of Hope, and then CC's Hope Center that uh, Council Member September is a board member on. Um, a lot of outreach uh, to our to those that have been victimized through human trafficking. All right, um, a look ahead of what what's coming. Uh, you saw the launch of the 988 crisis line um, that got us thinking and and talking about some other opportunities. Um, Obviously, employee mental health, we're doing everything we can with our peer team. Uh, Fire's got their peer team, and now there's a, a citywide uh, peer team that's working as well to make sure our employee health is taken into consideration at all times. You're seeing it when we design buildings. You're seeing it when we hire our people, making sure that we do everything we can to take care of them. But I, I mentioned the 988. We looked at Solari is a local group that provides additional training and resources there. Tempe and Mesa partnered up with them to where they're actually in their dispatch center. So if someone calls, right now we can divert someone to the 988 number and it's effective and they get service, but this is a little bit better service where they're in-house at least certain hours and when they're not, then it just goes to the 988 number. But they're in-house, they can actually triage those calls and make the best decision of, is it best to send uh, police officers out there or do they just need a, a counselor? Or do they just need to talk to somebody? So that Solari program, which we're proposing to get into, would provide training not only for our dispatchers and our officers, but also provide actual on-site services to where we could divert callers to them and potentially resources out in the field. Uh, a CRT cl uh, clinician, we'll talk about when we talk about the op opioids, but we would like to get a clinic, clini sorry, a clinician assigned to the crisis response team. And then community suicide prevention education goes hand in hand with everything I just mentioned of different opportunities for us to educate. We've been looking, talking to Chandler schools about different ways to uh, work with them to focus on suicide prevention. I mentioned uh, performance management. We are uh, going through performance management now of uh, focusing on our goals and how to um, share that with the community and improve. And then Spider Tech, real quick, that is twofold. One, it does automated victims' rights notifications, but also it's a community engagement tool. Just like when you get an Amazon order and they say, hey, your package was delivered, thumbs up, thumbs down. How do we do? So anytime you call for a non-emergency uh, case, it'll get feed, uh, allow you to give feedback to both the dispatchers, the patrol officers, and if it ends up going to a detective, the detectives can give feedback as well. All right, wrapping up. Mesa, I mentioned Solari, just some stats from Mesa. This is from September um, of 2022. They diverted 349 phone calls just through dispatch that came into either 911 or their non-emergency numbers that they were able to divert to Solari instead of sending a patrol officer out to. Um, you can see over the months, um, you can see on this top graph, when they started, very few calls were diverted and as they got more experience and everyone was getting used to it, they started recognizing and being better trained on how to divert calls to Solari rather than to patrol. And that's the whole goal is minimize patrol's exposure to those that are in crisis, because that's where a lot of times we have, unfortunately, um, bad situations where we're trying to get people help, they don't understand or they don't react well to, to the uniforms, and it turns into a physical altercation. Um, their average response time is in about 18 minutes, which is about normal for someone that's not in an emergency, but they need help. Uh, so that's not a bad response time. And then they spent 348, 384 hours just on crisis uh, calls within uh, Solari. Their top five calls that they're getting, suicide uh, threats or uh, uh, thoughts, uh, welfare checks, family fights, agency assist, and subjects disturbing. So it's been very successful both there and in uh, Tempe. Uh, this is just a photo from one of our events back in early October. There was a na nationwide um, Faith in Blue uh, weekend, and we partnered up with Evident Life Church to open, do pancakes, prayers, and, and uh, uh, pa pancakes with, with the, the community. A good turnout. That is the transparency roadmap. A lot of information really quick. Sorry, I talked real fast and I'm losing my voice. Um, any questions or ideas or concerns? Chief, we're going to tag team this one uh, working together. As far as the opioid settlement funding, 
talk a little bit about where that money came from, but the, really the team's been working. We had a multi-departmental team that assembled. Uh, Chris Payne came and kind of explained to us kind of the information about the monies that were coming available to Gilbert as a result that got dispersed to Arizona as a result of the large settlement on the related to the opioid addiction crisis uh, across the country. So we assembled our team and sat down, kind of get the stakeholders together, talk about what opportunities did we have as community members to help the community. So we sat, had again all different departments together discussing the opportunities that we had through that uh, process. So kind of the ask today is we're gonna offer up near the end of the Chief Solberg will some recommendations. And we're not looking for a full thumbs up, yes, go forward. We're kind of looking for, are we headed down the right path? Does the methodology of where we're headed on the recommendations make sense? So really just kind of a general direction, yes, we're headed the right direction based upon the information that we had. So I believe if I'm doing this right. Perfect. So a little bit of the background uh, talked about this. I kind of led into this uh, where Arizona's allotment of the monies related to the um, the settlement and the numbers we talked about are roughly a little under $200,000 the next nine years and then past that about $135,000 annually. And if I can just add, so the, there there have been two large settlements. There's a federal multi-district litigation case. It's, it's all these Hundreds and hundreds of cases have been consolidated in front of one federal judge in Cleveland. Um, these are approximate numbers with the settlements going forward now. There are bankruptcies from some parties that are part of the settlements that may impact the ultimate dollar amount. There's other parties that weren't part of the initial settlements that will be added in later. So these numbers are going to fluctuate, but this is our best estimate now of where they are. And there are two large settlements, one with opioid distributors and the other one with manufacturers and then different parties coming into that. Thank you, Chris. Kind of gives a highlight in the background of when the monies are coming and our monies are coming available now uh, as starting to, as far as from the settlement. So uh, requirements, uh, the settlement, what we can use the funds for is fairly wide ranging. And when you look through the 12 uh, from programs to support treatment, education, um, uh, law enforcement, specific criminal justice related, uh, quite a bit. And uh, so as we look through these, we try to figure out what's the greatest impact to our community. And number two I'm gonna point out uh, primarily is number two, the support of people in treatment and recovery. And number four, addressing the needs of the criminal justice related to opioid use. And as already been mentioned before in the cast member Tilke uh, on the community engagement task force, we spent a lot of time talking about the relationship between addiction and mental health. Councilmember Lech Torgerson specifically mentioned. They're intertwined. And so when we looked at some of the opportunities we have here, it's a pretty easy link to see that as we support opportunities for mental illness, it falls in line also with supporting uh, the opioid addictions we feel aligns well with this opportunity as we look towards the recommendations. You'll see that's really our, one of our primary opportunities to impact the communities. By the communities being our residents, our residents are intertwined with our schools, with our businesses. So anything we can do to help our residents is gonna help our businesses, help our workforce we already know is strapped, also help our schools in those opportunities. So really this is a tremendous opportunity to have direct impact to our community across all those different levels. Additionally, number four I bring up, there's a lot of barriers for people who enter the criminal justice system, however they entered it. And one of the opportunities we discussed when we're talking to different stakeholders are, what are the barriers if someone is trying to be successful, either in their treatment or in their sobriety, if they have a bad day or they have a bad interaction, what are the things that are gonna bring that person back into the criminal justice system that's gonna be a barrier to the treatment and recovery? So those are the two areas as we put together our stakeholder group that we kind of landed on as what we felt was the greatest areas of opportunity to support the community. And I think at this point, I'm gonna turn back over to Chief Solberg and he'll kind of give you a list Real of quick, the recommendations. Chief, the um, if I could just add on that, these are the categories that the funds must be utilized. They're, they're special, they're restricted funds. The monies for the settlement come to the state, they get distributed to counties and then come to the different cities and towns. Is this all of them? I don't remember. Are there others? There's a list in the settlement of, I think this, was everything. this is okay. So this is everything and the only thing that can be used for any combination thereof, but these are the uses and we do have to account annually for any monies that are spent that we receive. We have to provide accounting to the county and they do, and which goes to the state, which does audit. So again, these monies that we receive and to date we've received, I think at $80,000, they are placed in a separate restricted account and can only be used for any of these purposes. Thank you. 
So the proposal from the group, the subcommittee, as Rob mentioned, uh, is this. Uh, Gilbert Muni Municipal Court ordered, and I'll dive into each one of these after this slide. Uh, municipal Court, uh, for court ordered your analysis, your analysis. Uh, they, very few that they uh, need to pay for. They've been paying for it out of their budget. It's unbudgeted. So they're rec requesting $1,000. Uh, Gilbert Youth and Adult Resource Resources, your analysis test, the $30,000 for the uh, ones that are required from our counseling area. And then uh, the Police Department Behavior Health Co-Responder, $100,000. And I'll explain that in a second. And then the A vehicle uh, to go with the uh, behavioral cons uh, counselor. And then the last one, that all adds up to just over 200,000. So that's why the last one says partial funding, the narcotics drug incinerator. And so now I'll explain what each of those are. Uh, for the year analysis tests, uh, but with the court and with the um, counseling services that are within PD, uh, these are tests where they don't have coverage. They they need to pay for them themselves, and they have fi financial hardships. They can request that they be paid for. As I mentioned, the courts have been paying those. Um, so looking to offset those costs and providing roughly thirty-one thousand dollars between the two of us. Um, that will offset those costs to provide uh, the urinalysis tests, which they are required to do as part of their sentencing so that they can show that they're clean and uh, proceed with their, hopefully with their successful rehab. Uh, provides funding for initial drug testing for defendants, as I mentioned, mitigates the possibility for defendants to fail. Um, the next one is the behavior health co-responder. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we were focusing on mental health, but often the drugs go hand in hand with the mental health. And so not every call that are gonna go on is gonna be op opioid related, but some of them are. So based on the, the broad general uh, descriptions and in, in the requirements, we felt it was a good mix because it does tie both sides in, both the mental health and the drug use and opioid abuse in with it. So this would provide a full-time counselor, a clinician to ride with our police officers. Um, but it wouldn't just be for PD's use. If fire needed them, that's why we were asking for the car to go with it. So if they're not on a call with PD and fire has a situation where they need a counselor, because they'll come across that where it's not a police situation, there's not a crime committed, but they, they, that person they're dealing with could use some counseling, um, they could call for that clinician to come to their location. And so that's why the, rather than just sitting in the back of the car with our police officers, they'd have their own car, it gives us some flexibility to serve the entire city at, at any given time. Um, we have looked at different models. We quoted $100,000. We just got the quote the other day. It looks like it's me 122,000. The good thing is that's the benefits are provided um, through uh, uh, CRT, Crisis Response Team. What's uh, Sherry's, McSherry, CPR. C CPR. Um, so that's where we got the quote from, and which is in line with what the other Mesa and Tempe that uh, they've been quoted. So this will provide that extra benefit. Our, our officers aren't obviously clinicians. They have a lot of extra training, but this is someone who's actually a licensed clinician that would be with them and help them make an evaluation. Of what's the best opportunity for this person to get some help? And so it'd be with us for 40 hours a week. They cover the benefits. They would cover um, the supervision. Basically, it's a contract that we would have with CPR. And we work with them already as our psychologist for our employees. Um, so that would help us as well. That was something that we were looking at as an FTE request in the future, but we wanted to try this model out first once we saw that this was an opportunity for some funding. Um, and so there's an opportunity if it's successful and if there's the demand, we could use additional money. That 200,000 that I showed you, um, this would be an ongoing if we wanted to continue it. The car is just a one time, the, the next item is a one time, but the year analysis is a, would be an ongoing. So really about 180, 170 would be ongoing based on this and the, the UA test. And so we have some flexibility in the future years to plug in some other options or add a second person if need be. Uh, the narcotic drug incinerator, that might sound a little bit weird, but um, a lot of people don't know, everyone in the Valley goes to Globe to burn all their drugs and all their um, paraphernalia. Um, they've offered that for years and years, but they are 
uh, greatly increasing their rates. If I remember correctly, it's $3,000 an hour is what they're going to charge us now. And so us and everyone else are looking for options. We found one down around Tucson that would do it for a little bit cheaper, but it's not much cheaper. Um, so we are proposing uh, using some of this money to uh, purchase a drug, a narcotic drug incinerator. Um, it's EPA approved and whatnot. It's roughly $59,000, but it's something that we can do here in, in town and burn all of our uh, narcotics. That That's the only way we can get rid of it. Um, but it just, it's a very fine dust. It, it does a really good job of doing it. So it'd be a one-time purchase and it'd be something that um, would be here rather than driving out to uh, Globe or down to Tucson. And then I think that's it. So just asking for direction um, that we, like uh, Chief Duggan said, we're not voting today. Uh, are just getting a approval that we're in the right direction and to proceed with the recommendations that we have. Okay, hey, that wraps up our fall 2022 council retreat. I know we covered a lot of information over the last two days. So what staff will do in follow-up, we'll send an email to all of you and recap each of the items, ones that had direction from you. <clears throat> we will summarize that and, and um, ensure that that's your understanding as well for the things that there will be uh, additional action and follow-up on. Um, and outside of that, we want to thank and welcome our three new council member elects, and we appreciate you participating today. The majority of these things that we discussed and the direction was provided on are going to be coming to you in the coming months and years uh, for the actions that we'll be taking for the betterment of our community. Um, that big thank you to Elena again for and her team, Jordan and Carmelita. And I'm sure there's many others. Alina, maybe why don't you come up here and make sure we recognize everyone. This is a lot of work. Um, for anybody who's ever been a part of putting together anything like this, there is a small army of people that are behind the scenes that make it all sm flow smoothly, make sure the technology works. So, And this is the third thing that Alina's done in uh, four weeks' time, so in the last, at least for now. Uh, but we couldn't thank them enough, and, and thank you for all of your participation. I thought we had a lot of great dialogue today. I don't know, uh, Mayor, if there's anything you'd like to add before I turn it over to Alina. Uh, 